Bill Clinton's apology to the nation regarding the Lewinsky affair by William Jefferson Clinton. This is a Ripperfox recording. All Ripperfox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit Ripperfox.org. Bill Clinton's apology to the nation regarding the Lewinsky affair by William Jefferson Clinton. Delivered August 19th, 1998. This afternoon in this room, from this chair, I testified before the Office of Independent Counsel and the Grand Jury. I answered their questions truthfully, including questions about my private life, questions no American citizen would ever want to answer. Still, I must take complete responsibility for all my actions, both public and private. And that is why I am speaking to you tonight. As you know, in a deposition in January, I was asked questions about my relationship with Michael Lewinsky. While my answers were reasonably accurate, I did not volunteer information. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Mr. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. It constituted a critical lapse in judgment and a personal failure in my part, for which I am sorry and completely responsible. But I told the grand jury today, and I say to you now, that at no time did I ask anyone to lie, to idle destroy evidence, or to take any other unlawful action. I know that my public comments and my silence about this matter gave a false impression. I misled people, including even my wife. I do regret that. I can only tell you I was motivated by many factors. First, by a desire to protect myself from the embarrassment of my own conduct. I was also very concerned about protecting my family. The fact that these questions were being asked in a politically inspired lawsuit, which has since been dismissed, was a consideration too. In addition, I had real and serious concerns about an independent counsel investigation that began with private business during 20 years ago, there is a my ad about which an independent federal agency found no evidence of any wrongdoing by me or my wife over two years ago. The independent counsel investigation moved on to my stubborn friends, then into my private life, and now the investigation itself is under investigation. This has gone on too long, cost too much, and hurt too many innocent people. Now this bears between me, the two pair of love boats, my wife and our daughter, and our God. I must put it right, and I am prepared to do whatever it takes to do so. Nothing is more important to me personally, but it is private, and I intend to reclaim my family life for my family. It's nobody's business but ours. Even presidents have private lives. It is time to stop the pursuit of personal destruction and applying into private lives and get on with our national life. Our country has been distracted by this matter for too long, and I take my responsibility for my part in all of this. That is all I can do. Now it is time, in fact it is past time to move on. We have important work to do, we all chose to seize, we all promise to solve, we all security mass to face. And so tonight, I ask you to turn away from the spectacle of the past seven months to repair the fabric of our national discourse and to return our attention to all the challenges and all the problems of the next American century. Thank you for watching, and good night. End of Bill Clinton's apology to the nation regarding the Lewinsky affair by William Chelsea Clinton. Read by Glenn O'Brien, www.glennobrien.net. Daisy by Encyclopedia Britannica, 1911 edition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Daisy by Encyclopedia Britannica. A.S. Dages Ij. Des I. The name applied to the plants constituting the genus Bellus of the natural order Compositae. The genus contains ten species found in Europe and the Mediterranean region. The common daisy, Bellus perennis, is the only representative of the genus in the British Isles. It is a perennial, abundant everywhere in pastures and on banks in Europe, except in the most northerly regions, and in Asia Minor, and occurs as an introduced plant in North America. The stem of the daisy is short, the leaves, which are numerous, and form a rosette are slightly hairy 
obovate, spathulate in shape, with rounded teeth on the margin in the upper part, and the rootstock is creeping, and of a brownish color. The flowers are to be found from March to November, and occasionally in the winter months. The heads of flowers are solitary, the outer or ray florets pink or white, the disc florets bright yellow. The size and luxuriance of the plant are much affected by the nature of the soil in which it grows. The cultivated varieties, which are numerous, bear finely colored flowers and make very effective borders for walks. What is known as the hen and chicken daisy has the main head surrounded by a brood of sometimes as many as ten or twelve small heads formed in the axles of the scales of the involucre. The ray florets curve inwards and close the flower head in dull weather and towards evening. Chaucer writes, The daisy, or else the eye of the day, the empress, and the flower of flores, all. And again, To see this flower against this sunny spread, when it riseth early by the morrow, that blissful sight softeneth all my sorrow. And the flower is often alluded to with admiration by the other poets of nature. To the farmer, however, the daisy is a weed, and a most wasteful one, as it exhausts the soil and is not eaten by any kind of stock. In French, the daisy is termed la marguerite, Greek, marguerites, a pearl, and herb margaret is stated to be an old English appellation for it. In Scotland, it is popularly called the gowan, and in Yorkshire, it is the bairnwort, or flower beloved by children. The Christmas and Michaelmas daisies are species of aster. The oxide daisy is chrysanthemum leucanthemum, a common weed in meadows and waste places. Bellus perennis florid pleno, the double daisy, consists of dwarf, showy, three to four inch plants, flowering freely in spring if grown in rich light soil and frequently divided and transplanted. The white and pink forms, with the white and red quilled, and the variegated leaved acubefolia, are some of the best. End of Daisy by Encyclopedia Britannica. Driving the Lincoln Highway, Chicago to Rochelle, Illinois, in 1915 by emily post this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org mud we have struck it it looks pretty much as though our motor trip to san francisco were going to end in rochelle illinois Thirty-six miles out of Chicago, we met the Lincoln Highway, and from the first found it a disappointment, as the most important, advertised, and lauded road in our country, its first appearance was not engaging. If it were called the Cross-Continent Trail, you would expect little, and be philosophical about less. But the very word highway suggests macadam at the least, and with such titles as Transcontinental and Lincoln put before it, you dream of a wide, straight road like the Route Nationale of France or state roads in the East, and you wake rather unhappily to the actuality of a meandering dirt road that becomes mud half a foot deep after a day or two of rain. Still, we went over it easily enough until we passed DeKalb. After that, the only highway attributes left were the painted red, white, and blue signs decorating the telegraph poles along the way. The highway itself 
disappeared into a wallow of mud. The center of the road was slightly turtle-backed. The sides were of thick, black ooze and ungageably deep, and the car was possessed as though it were alive to pivot around and slide backward into it. We had no chains with us and had passed no places where we could get any. Apart from the difficulty of keeping going on the chainless tires, our only danger, except that of being bogged, was in getting over the bridges that had no railings to their approaches. The car chasséed up every one, swung over toward the embankment, slewed back on the bridge, went across that steadily, and dove into the mud again. It certainly was dampening to one's ardor for motoring. If the Lincoln Highway was like this, what would the ordinary road be after it branched away at Sterling? A little car on ahead was slithering and sliding around, too, although it had four chains on it. But it did not sink in very far, and it was getting along much better than we were, so much better, in fact, that at the end of a few miles it slowly wobbled beyond our sight. Finally, we turned a bend, and there was a little car on ahead. Not the same one, however. This one evidently had no chains, and was coming toward us, drunkenly staggering from side to side. Gradually, the lower half of it was hidden by the incline of an intervening bridge. Then, suddenly, it disappeared altogether. When we arrived at the bridge ourselves, we saw the car in a deep ditch, almost over on its side. The occupants of it, a man and a small boy, were both out and nothing apparently was hurt. The small boy was having a heavenly time, paddling around in mud way above his knees. And the man called up to us cheerfully, "'Twas my own fault. I had not to come without chains on. No use for you to stop, thank you. You couldn't help any, and we'd only block the road between us. A team will be along before long. Regretfully, we left them, and slipped and slid and staggered on for some miles more. Oh, said Celia in the back, how are we ever going up that? That was an awful embankment ahead which to look at made me feel as if I had eaten nothing for a week. It was steep, narrow, turtle-backed, with black slime, and had a terrifying drop at either side of its treacherous and unguarded edges. The car went snorting up the incline until, nearly at the top point where the drop was steepest, it balked and slid toward the edge. This is the end, I thought, wondering in the same second if any of us would fall clear. For one of those eternity-laden moments we seemed to hang poised on the brink. Then E.M. seemed almost to lift the huge weight of the machine around bodily and compel it in spite of its helplessness, to crawl up, up, up on the bridge. Glancing back at Celia, after we were safely over, she looked about as chalky and weak-kneed as I felt. A short distance further, however, we ran on the brick pavement of a town. The ragged red brick buildings of the street we turned into were not very encouraging, and we feared that again the Blue Book's hotel description might be one of those complimentary ones consisting of its paid advertisement. E. M. urged our trying to get chains and going on to Davenport, but Celia and I had all the motoring in the mud that we cared about. 
no matter how squalid the town or how poor the accommodations we meant to cross no more bridges like that last one until the roads dried then we made two turns like a letter z and found ourselves in the sweetest cleanest newest little town imaginable its streets were all wide and smoothly paved with brick and its houses mostly white were set each in a garden of trim and clipped green there was a new post office of marble magnificence and a shopping center of big windowed fresh painted enterprising stores but no hotel except a dingy ramshackle tavern that we took for granted was the one mentioned in the guidebook we wondered if one of the neat sweet little houses might perhaps take us to board instead in front of a garage was a man with a blue coat and brass buttons and fire chief on them we asked him if he knew anyone at whose house we could stay until the road dried he looked at us and then at the car in a quizzical sort of way oh yes he drawled you could put up at mrs blake's i guess we asked the way to mrs blake's and then happened to remark that it was curious a town as up-to-date as this one had no good hotel he lost his drawl immediately no good hotel well i just guess there is a good hotel the collier inn is just across that street and around the corner it's a fine hotel we cheered up instantly but why hadn't he told us that sooner he thought that considering we had asked for a boarding house maybe the hotel was too high priced for us but it was a fine hotel if we didn't mind the cost i don't know how we had missed it it was a fair-sized yellow brick building on a corner a rather typical small town commercial hotel i went in expecting dingy darkness the lobby looked like the office in a main summer resort i asked not that i for a moment expected to get it for rooms with baths the proprietor said certainly and showed me three new little rooms each with a little new bathroom attached i returned to my companions grinning like a cheshire cat it seemed to us as though we had found a veritable ritz in rochelle twenty-four hours in a town like this and we feel as though we knew it and the people intimately in many ways it suggests a toyland town its streets are so straight and evenly laid its houses so white and shining its gardens so green its shops so freshly painted its displays in the windows so new and its people so friendly strangers in town they seem to say to themselves as they look at us but instead of looking at us in a wait until we know who you are before we take any notice of you they seem quite ready to smile and begin a conversation our most particular friend as well as our oldest acquaintance is the fire chief e m of course has one or two other particular friends in the garage if he can only find a mechanic or two to talk to he is perfectly happy celia's and my chief diversion has been going to the moving picture theaters which is evidently the fashionable thing to do here in the evening we saw three real theater parties one of them was a very important affair they met in the lobby and went down the aisle two by two the ladies all had many diamonds brand new white kid gloves quite tight picture hats 
corsage bouquets and boxes of candy celia and i had neither gloves nor hats on and when we ran into the theatre parties we felt almost like urchins that had been caught wandering into the foyer of the metropolitan opera house like our hatred of caraway seeds our love of hatlessness must be a family failing in chicago two different papers took the trouble to mention e m s carelessness in the matter of head covering scorning to wear a hat even on occasions when it is generally considered to be convenable said one the other described him as such a disciple of fresh air that he was seen driving a big racing machine on michigan avenue without a hat yet isn't it a popular supposition that the west is freer from conventions than the east the rain has finally stopped and this morning the sun is trying hard to shine to do much good it will have to shine steadily for about three days we walked to the end of the brick paving down one of the streets a little while ago and looked at the black wet lincoln highway leading to sterling on our way back we met our friend the fire chief been to look at the mud asked he cheerfully it isn't a bit bad now you ought to see it when it's muddy why it took me eight hours to go twenty-one miles i did have to get a team of horses to pull me out of one bog but otherwise i got through all right didn't you strain your engine i asked him oh yes he said cheerfully i guess i did but i couldn't help that well maybe you couldn't i agreed then added with confidential finality but i tell you what we're going to do we're going to put ours on a nice dry comfortable freight car tomorrow morning and ship it past the mud district which is probably the width of the continent his warmth of manner fell suddenly to zero i feared we had in some way offended him because we thought his state muddy of course it is a lovely country to grow things in i added quickly but you see we want particularly to get to san francisco and the surest way is by freight but we could not put the broken conversation together again in fact our friend the fire chief doesn't smile any more our other friends the garage men also look at us askance in fact in some way we seem to have lost our popularity the weight of public opinion we know now what is the matter they think we are quitters they are so filled with a sense of shame for us that we are beginning to feel it ourselves in spite of our original intention to go only so far as roads were good and accommodations were comfortable we feel that we are somehow lacking in metal that we are sandless to say the least to explain that we are not crossing the continent as a feat of endurance is useless having started to motor to the west our stopping this side of the place we set out for is to them incomprehensible why that car ought to go through anything is all any of them can think of saying to us our friend the fire chief stood glowering out in front of the garage all morning i think he would have gone to great lengths to prevent our machine's incarceration in a freight car the proprietor of the garage gave us his opinion of course we drive pretty light machines around here and yours is heavy and your wheels are uncommon narrow but that engine of yours sure ain't no toy i'd go through if i was you 
I wouldn't quit for a little mud, no, sir. And only a little mud at that, scornfully echoed the fire chief. And supposing we slide off one of those bridges, or turn turtle in a ditch, asked we. The chief scratched his head, but his determination was undaunted. She'd be kind of heavy to fall on you, he grinned. All the same, if that car was mine, I'd go right on plumb across hell itself, I would. To finish what you have begun, to see it through at whatever cost, that seems to be the spirit here. It is probably the spirit of the West, the spirit that has doubled and trebled these towns in a few years. The consideration as to whether it is the wisest and most expedient thing to do has no part in their process of reasoning. That is exactly the point. Theirs not to reason why, theirs not to make reply, theirs but to do and die. Only they do not seem to die. They thrive gloriously. All the same, if this country of ours ever gets into the war, there will be the making of a second Balaclava regiment in a town of Illinois, beginning with an R, and a certain fire chief should make a gallant captain. But magnificent as is their indomitability as a quality of character, for us, the instance to wreck a valuable car, which we might never afford to replace, for the sake of saying that we were not stopped by any such trifle as mud, seems more foolhardy than courageous. Nevertheless, they have in some way imbued us with their spirit to such a degree that we have countermanded the freight car, and although the mud is not a bit better, have put chains on and are going to start. Enthusiasm was no name for it. The town turned out to see us off. The fire chief drove out his engine in all its brass and scarlet resplendency. The ban of our cowardly leanings toward freight cars was lifted, and they saw us off on our muddy way rejoicing. We are glad to have seen this little town. Maybe the contagion of its enthusiasm will remain with us permanently. End of Driving the Lincoln Highway, Chicago to Rochelle, Illinois, in 1915 By Emily Post Read by Sue Anderson Earthquakes by K. M. Shedlock and Louis C. Packiser. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Roger Moline. Earthquakes by K. M. Shedlock and Louis C. Packiser. One of the most frightening and destructive phenomena of nature is a severe earthquake and its terrible after-effects. An earthquake is a sudden movement of the earth caused by the abrupt release of strain that has accumulated over a long time. For hundreds of millions of years, the forces of plate tectonics have shaped the earth as the huge plates that form the earth's surface slowly move over, under, and past each other. Sometimes the movement is gradual. At other times the plates are locked together, unable to release the accumulating energy. When the accumulated energy grows strong enough, the plates break free. If the earthquake occurs in a populated area, it may cause many deaths and injuries and extensive property damage. Today we are challenging the assumption that earthquakes must present an uncontrollable and unpredictable hazard to life and property. 
scientists have begun to estimate the locations and likelihoods of future damaging earthquakes. Sites of greatest hazard are being identified, and definite progress is being made in designing structures that will withstand the effects of earthquakes. Earthquakes in History The scientific study of earthquakes is comparatively new. Until the 18th century, few factual descriptions of earthquakes were recorded, and the natural cause of earthquakes was little understood. Those who did look for natural causes often reached conclusions that seem fanciful today. One popular theory was that earthquakes were caused by air rushing out of caverns, deep in the earth's interior. The earliest earthquake for which we have descriptive information occurred in China in 1177 B.C. The Chinese earthquake catalog describes several dozen large earthquakes in China during the next few thousand years. Earthquakes in Europe are mentioned as early as 580 B.C., but the earliest for which we have some descriptive information occurred in the mid-16th century. The earliest known earthquakes in the Americas were in Mexico in the late 14th century and in Peru in 1471, but descriptions of the effects were not well documented. By the 17th century, descriptions of the effects of earthquakes were being published around the world, although these accounts were often exaggerated or distorted. The most widely felt earthquakes in the recorded history of North America were a series that occurred in 1811-1812 near New Madrid, Missouri. A great earthquake, whose magnitude is estimated to be about eight, occurred on the morning of December 16, 1811. Another great earthquake occurred on January 23, 1812, and a third, the strongest yet, on February 7, 1812. Aftershocks were nearly continuous between these great earthquakes, and continued for months afterwards. These earthquakes were felt by people as far away as Boston and Denver, because the most intense effects were in a sparsely populated region, the destruction of human life and property was slight. If just one of these enormous earthquakes occurred in the same area today, millions of people and buildings and other structures worth billions of dollars would be affected. The San Francisco earthquake of 1906 was one of the most destructive in the recorded history of North America. The earthquake and the fire that followed killed nearly 700 people and left the city in ruins. The Alaska earthquake of March 27, 1964, was of greater magnitude than the San Francisco earthquake. It released perhaps twice as much energy and was felt over an area of almost 500,000 square miles. The ground motion near the epicenter was so violent that the tops of some trees were snapped off. 114 people, some as far away as California, died as a result of this earthquake, but loss of life and property would have been far greater had Alaska been more densely populated. Where Earthquakes Occur the earth is formed of several layers that have very different physical and chemical properties. The outer layer, which averages about 70 kilometers in thickness, consists of about a dozen large, irregularly shaped plates that slide over, under, and past each other on top of the partly molten inner layer. Most earthquakes occur at the boundaries where the plates meet. In fact, the locations of earthquakes and the kinds of ruptures they produce help scientists define the plate boundaries. There are three types of plate boundaries, spreading zones, transform faults, and subduction zones. At spreading zones, molten rock rises, pushing two plates apart, 
and adding new material at their edges. Most spreading zones are found in oceans. For example, the North American and Eurasian plates are spreading apart along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Spreading zones usually have earthquakes at shallow depths, within 30 kilometers of the surface. Transform faults are found where plates slide past one another. An example of a transform fault plate boundary is the San Andreas Fault, along the coast of California and northwestern Mexico. Earthquakes at transform faults tend to occur at shallow depths and form fairly straight linear patterns. Subduction zones are found where one plate overrides or subducts another, pushing it downward into the mantle where it melts. An example of a subduction zone plate boundary is found along the northwest coast of the United States, western Canada, and southern Alaska and the Aleutian Islands. Subduction zones are characterized by deep ocean trenches, shallow to deep earthquakes, and mountain ranges containing active volcanoes. Earthquakes can also occur within plates, although plate boundary earthquakes are much more common. Less than 10% of all earthquakes occur within plate interiors. As plates continue to move and plate boundaries change over geologic time, weakened boundary regions become part of the interiors of the plates. These zones of weakness within the continents can cause earthquakes in response to stresses that originate at the edges of the plate or in the deeper crust. The New Madrid earthquakes of 1811 and 12 and the 1886 Charleston earthquake occurred within the North American plate. How Earthquakes Happen an earthquake is the vibration, sometimes violent, of the Earth's surface that follows a release of energy in the Earth's crust. This energy can be generated by a sudden dislocation of segments of the crust, by a volcanic eruption, or even by man-made explosions. Most destructive quakes, however, are caused by dislocations of the crust. The crust may first bend and then, when the stress exceeds the strength of the rocks, break and snap to a new position. In the process of breaking, vibrations called seismic waves are generated. These waves travel outward from the source of the earthquake along the surface and through the earth at varying speeds depending on the material through which they move. Some of the vibrations are high enough frequency to be audible while others are of very low frequency. These vibrations cause the entire planet to quiver or ring like a bell or a tuning fork. A fault is a fracture in the Earth's crust along which two blocks of the crust have slipped with respect to each other. Faults are divided into three main groups depending on how they move. Normal faults occur in response to pulling or tension. The overlying block moves down the dip of the fault plane. Thrust or reverse faults occur in response to squeezing or compression. The overlying block moves up the dip of the fault plane. Strike slip or lateral faults occur in response to either type of stress. The blocks move horizontally past one another. Most faulting along spreading zones is normal, along subduction zones is thrust, and along transform faults is strike slip. Geologists have found that earthquakes tend to recur along faults, which reflect zones of weakness in the Earth's crust. Even if a fault zone has recently experienced an earthquake, however, there is no guarantee that all the stress has been relieved. Another earthquake could still occur. In New Madrid, 
a great earthquake was followed by a large aftershock within six hours on December 16, 1811. Furthermore, relieving stress along one part of the fault may increase stress in another part. The New Madrid earthquakes in January and February 1812 may have resulted from this phenomenon. The focal depth of an earthquake is the depth from the Earth's surface to the region where an earthquake's energy originates, the focus. Earthquakes with focal depths from the surface to about 70 kilometers, or 43 and a half miles, are classified as shallow. Earthquakes with focal depths from 70 to 300 kilometers, 43 and a half to 186 miles, are classified as intermediate. The focus of depth earthquakes may reach depths of more than 700 kilometers, or 435 miles. The focuses of most earthquakes are concentrated in the crust and upper mantle. The depth to the center of the Earth's core is about 6,370 kilometers, or 3,960 miles so even the deepest earthquakes originate in relatively shallow parts of the Earth's interior. The epicenter of an earthquake is the point on the Earth's surface directly above the focus. The location of an earthquake is commonly described by the geographic position of its epicenter and by its focal depth. Earthquakes beneath the ocean floor sometimes generate immense sea waves or tsunamis, Japan's dread huge wave. These waves travel across the ocean at speeds as great as 960 kilometers per hour, 597 miles per hour, and may be 15 meters or 49 feet high or higher by the time they reach the shore. During the 1964 Alaska earthquake, tsunamis engulfing coastal areas caused most of the destruction at Kodiak, Cordova, and Seward, and caused severe damage along the west coast of North America, particularly at Crescent City, California. Some waves raced across the ocean to the coasts of Japan. Liquefaction, which happens when loosely packed, waterlogged sediments lose their strength in response to strong shaking, causes major damage during earthquakes. During the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, liquefaction of the soils and debris used to fill in a lagoon caused major subsidence, fracturing, and horizontal sliding of the ground surface in the marina district in San Francisco. Landslides triggered by earthquakes often cause more destruction than the earthquakes themselves. During the 1964 Alaska quake, shock-induced landslides devastated the Turnagain Heights residential development and many downtown areas in Anchorage. An observer gave a vivid report of the breakup of the unstable earth materials in the Turnagain Heights region. I got out of my car, ran northward toward my driveway, and then saw that the bluff had broken back approximately 300 feet southward from its original edge. Additional slumping of the bluff caused me to return to my car and back southward approximately 180 feet to the corner of Macaulay and Turnagain Parkway. The bluff slowly broke until the corner of Turnagain Parkway and Macaulay had slumped northward. Measuring Earthquakes The vibrations produced by earthquakes are detected, recorded, and measured by instruments called seismographs. The zigzag line made by a seismograph, called a seismogram, reflects the changing intensity of the vibrations by responding to the motion of the ground surface beneath the instrument. From the data expressed in seismograms, scientists can determine the time, the epicenter, the focal depth, and the type of faulting of an earthquake, and can estimate how much energy was released. 
The two general types of vibrations produced by earthquakes are surface waves, which travel along the Earth's surface, and body waves, which travel through the Earth. Surface waves usually have the strongest vibrations, and probably cause most of the damage done by earthquakes. Body waves are of two types, compressional and shear. Both types pass through the Earth's interior from the focus of an earthquake to distant points on the surface, but only compressional waves travel through the Earth's molten core. Because compressional waves travel at great speeds and ordinarily reach the surface first, they are often called primary waves, or simply P waves. P waves push tiny particles of Earth material directly ahead of them or displace the particles directly behind their line of travel. Shear waves do not travel as rapidly through the Earth's crust and mantle as do compressional waves, and because they ordinarily reach the surface later, they are called secondary, or S waves. Instead of affecting material directly behind or ahead of their line of travel, shear waves displace material at right angles to their path and are therefore sometimes called transverse waves. The first indication of an earthquake is often a sharp thud, signaling the arrival of compressional waves. This is followed by the shear waves and then the ground roll caused by the surface waves. A geologist who was at Valdez, Alaska during the 1964 earthquake described this sequence. The first tremors were hard enough to stop a moving person and shock waves were immediately noticeable on the surface of the ground. These shock waves continued with a rather long frequency, which gave the observer an impression of a rolling feeling, rather than abrupt hard jolts. After about one minute, the amplitude or strength of the shock waves increased in intensity, and failures in buildings as well as the frozen ground surface began to occur. After about three and a half minutes, the severe shock waves ended, and people began to react as could be expected. The severity of an earthquake can be expressed in several ways. The magnitude of an earthquake, usually expressed by the Richter scale, is a measure of the amplitude of the seismic waves. The moment magnitude of an earthquake is a measure of the amount of energy released, an amount that can be estimated from seismograph recordings. The intensity, as expressed by the modified Mercalli scale, is a subjective measure that describes how strong a shock was felt at a particular location. The Richter scale, named after Dr. Charles F. Richter of the California Institute of Technology, is the best known scale for measuring the magnitude of earthquakes. The scale is logarithmic, so that a recording of seven, for example, indicates a disturbance with ground motion ten times as large as a recording of six. A quake of magnitude two is the smallest quake normally felt by people. Earthquakes with a Richter value of six or more are commonly considered major. Great earthquakes have magnitudes of eight or more on the Richter scale. The modified Mercalli scale expresses the intensity of an earthquake's effects in a given locality in values ranging from 1 to 12. The most commonly used adaptation covers the range of intensity from the condition of 1, not felt except by a very few under especially favorable conditions, to 12, damage total. Lines of sight and level are distorted. Objects thrown upward into the air. Evaluation of earthquake intensity can be made only after eyewitness reports and results of field investigations are studied and interpreted. The maximum intensity experienced in the Alaska earthquake of 1964 was 10. 
damage from the San Francisco and New Madrid earthquakes reached a maximum intensity of 11. Earthquakes of large magnitude do not necessarily cause the most intense surface effects. The effect in a given region depends to a large degree on local surface and subsurface geologic conditions. An area underlain by unstable ground, sand, clay, or other unconsolidated materials, for example, is likely to experience much more noticeable effects than an area equally distant from the earthquake's epicenter, but underlain by firm ground, such as granite. In general, earthquakes east of the Rocky Mountains affect a much larger area than earthquakes west of the Rockies. An earthquake's destructiveness depends on many factors. In addition to magnitude and the local geologic conditions, these factors include the focal depth, the distance from the epicenter, and the design of buildings and other structures. The extent of damage also depends on the density of population and construction in the area shaken by the quake. The Loma Prieta earthquake of 1989 demonstrated a wide range of effects. The Santa Cruz Mountains suffered little damage from the seismic waves, even though they were close to the epicenter. The central core of the city of Santa Cruz about 24 kilometers, or 15 miles, away from the epicenter, was almost completely destroyed. More than 80 kilometers, or 50 miles, away, the cities of San Francisco and Oakland suffered selective but severe damage, including the loss of more than 40 lives. The greatest destruction occurred in areas where roads and elevated structures were built on unstable ground, underlain by loose, unconsolidated soils. The Northridge, California earthquake of 1994 also produced a wide variety of effects, even over distances of just a few hundred meters. Some buildings collapsed while adjacent buildings of similar age and construction remain standing. Similarly, some highway spans collapsed, while others nearby did not. Volcanoes and Earthquakes Earthquakes are associated with volcanic eruptions. Abrupt increases in earthquake activity heralded eruptions at Mount St. Helens, Washington. Mount Spur and Redoubt Volcano, Alaska, and Kilauea and Mauna Loa, Hawaii. The location and movement of swarms of tremors indicate the movement of magma through the volcano. Continuous records of seismic and tiltimeter, a device that measures ground tilting, data are maintained at U.S. Geological Survey volcano observatories in Hawaii, Alaska, California, and the Cascades, where study of these records enables specialists to make short-range predictions of volcanic eruptions. These warnings have been especially effective in Alaska, where the imminent eruption of a volcano requires the rerouting of international air traffic to enable airplanes to avoid volcanic clouds. Since 1982, at least seven jumbo jets, carrying more than 1,500 passengers, have lost power in the air after flying into clouds of volcanic ash. Though all flights were able to restart their engines eventually, and no lives were lost, the aircraft suffered damages of tens of millions of dollars. As a result of these close calls, an international team of volcanologists, meteorologists, dispatchers, pilots, and controllers have begun to work together to alert each other to imminent volcanic eruptions and to detect and track volcanic ash clouds. Predicting Earthquakes The goal of earthquake prediction is to give warning of potentially damaging earthquakes early enough to allow appropriate response to the disaster enabling people to minimize loss of life and property. 
the U.S. Geological Survey conducts and supports research on the likelihood of future earthquakes. This research includes field, laboratory, and theoretical investigations of earthquake mechanisms and fault zones. A primary goal of earthquake research is to increase the reliability of earthquake probability estimates. Ultimately, scientists would like to be able to specify a high probability for a specific earthquake on a particular fault within a particular year. Scientists estimate earthquake probabilities in two ways, by studying the history of large earthquakes in a specific area and the rate at which strain accumulates in the rock. Scientists study the past frequency of large earthquakes in order to determine the future likelihood of similar large shocks. For example, if a region has experienced four magnitude seven or larger earthquakes during 200 years of recorded history, and if these shocks occurred randomly in time, then scientists would assign a 50% probability, that is, just as likely to happen as not to happen, to the occurrence of another magnitude seven or larger quake in the region during the next 50 years. But in many places, the assumption of random occurrence with time may not be true, because when the strain is released along one part of the fault system, it may actually increase on another part. Four magnitude 6.8 or larger earthquakes and many magnitude 6 to 6.5 shocks occurred in the San Francisco Bay region during the 75 years between 1836 and 1911. For the next 68 years until 1979, no earthquakes of magnitude 6 or larger occurred in the region. Beginning with a magnitude 6.0 shock in 1979, the earthquake activity in the region increased dramatically. Between 1979 and 1989, there were four magnitude 6 or greater earthquakes, including the magnitude 7.1 Loma Prieta earthquake. This clustering of earthquakes leads scientists to estimate that the probability of a magnitude 6.8 or larger earthquake occurring during the next 30 years in the San Francisco Bay region is about 67 percent, twice as likely as not. Another way to estimate the likelihood of future earthquakes is to study how fast strain accumulates. When plate movements build the strain in rocks to a critical level, like pulling a rubber band too tight, the rocks will suddenly break and slip to a new position. Scientists measure how much strain accumulates along a fault segment each year, how much time has passed since the last earthquake along the segment, and how much strain was released in the last earthquake. This information is then used to calculate the time required for the accumulating strain to build to the level that results in an earthquake. This simple model is complicated by the fact that such detailed information about faults is rare. In the United States, only the San Andreas fault system has adequate records for using this prediction method. Both of these methods and a wide array of monitoring techniques are being tested along part of the San Andreas Fault. For the past 150 years, earthquakes of about magnitude 6 have occurred on an average of every 22 years on the San Andreas Fault near Parkfield, California. The last shock was in 1966. Because of the consistency and similarity of these earthquakes, scientists have started an experiment to capture the next Parkfield earthquake. A dense web of monitoring instruments was deployed in the region during the late 1980s. The main goals of the ongoing Parkfield earthquake prediction experiment 
are to record the geophysical signals before and after the expected earthquake, to issue a short-term prediction, and to develop effective methods of communication between earthquake scientists and community officials responsible for disaster response and mitigation. This project has already made important contributions to both earth science and public policy. Scientific understanding of earthquakes is of vital importance to the nation. As the population increases, expanding urban development and construction works encroach upon areas susceptible to earthquakes. With a greater understanding of the causes and effects of earthquakes, we may be able to reduce damage and loss of life from this destructive phenomenon. As the nation's principal conservation agency, the Department of the Interior has responsibility for most of our nationally owned public lands and natural and cultural resources. This includes fostering sound use of our land and water resources, protecting our fish, wildlife, and biological diversity, preserving the environmental and cultural values of our national parks and historical places, and providing for the enjoyment of life through outdoor recreation. The department assesses our energy and mineral resources and works to ensure that their development is in the best interest of all our people by encouraging stewardship and citizen participation in their care. The department also has a major responsibility for American Indian reservation communities and for people who live in island territories under U.S. administration. End of Earthquakes This recording has been by Roger Moline. Five American Contributions to Civilization by Charles William Eliot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Looking back over 40 centuries of history, we observe that many nations have made characteristic contributions to the progress of civilization, the beneficent effects of which have been permanent, although the races that made them may have lost their national form and organization or their relative standing among the nations of the earth. Thus, the Hebrew race, during many centuries, made supreme contributions to religious thought, and the Greek, during the brief climax to the race, to speculative philosophy, architecture, sculpture, and the drama. The Roman people developed military colonization, aqueducts, roads, and bridges, and a great body of public law, large parts of which still survive, and the Italians of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance developed ecclesiastical organization and the fine arts as tributary to the splendor of the church and to municipal luxury. England for several centuries has contributed to the institutional development of representative government and public justice. The Dutch, in the 16th century, made a superb struggle for free thought and free government. France, in the 18th century, taught the doctrine of individual freedom and the theory of human rights. And Germany, at two periods within the 19th century, 50 years apart, proved a vital force of the sentiment of nationality. I ask you to consider with me what characteristic and durable contributions the American people have been making to the progress of civilization. The first and principal contribution to which I shall ask your attention is the advance made in the United States, not in theory only, but in practice, toward the abandonment of war as the means of settling disputes between nations, the substitution of discussion and arbitration, and avoidance of armaments. If the intermittent Indian fighting and the brief contest with the Barbary Corsairs be disregarded, the United States have had only four years and a quarter of international war in 107 years since the adoption of the Constitution. Within the same period, the United States have been party to 47 arbitrations, being more than half of all that have taken place in the modern world. The questions settled by these arbitrations have been just such as have commonly caused wars, namely questions of boundary, fishery, damage caused by war or civil disturbances, 
losses and injuries to commerce. Some of them were of great magnitude, the four made under the Treaty of Washington, May 8, 1871, being the most important that have ever taken place, confident in their strength and relying on their ability to adjust international differences. The United States have habitually maintained, by voluntary enlistment for short terms, a standing army and a fleet which, in proportion to the population, are insignificant. The beneficent effects of this American contribution to civilization are of two sorts. In the first place, the direct evils of war and of preparations for war have been diminished. And secondly, the influence of the war spirit on the perennial conflict between the rights of the single personal unit and the powers of the multitude that constitute organized society, or, in other words, between individual freedom and collective authority, has been reduced to the lowest terms. War has been, and still is, the school of collectivism, the warrant of tyranny. Century after century, tribes, clans, and nations have sacrificed the liberty of the individual to the fundamental necessity of being strong for combined defense or attack in war. Individual freedom is crushed in war, for the nature of war is inevitably despotic. It says to the private person, obey without a question, even unto death, die in this ditch without knowing why, walk into that deadly thicket, mount this embankment, behind which are men who will try to kill you, lest you should kill them, make part of an immense machine for blind destruction, cruelty, rapine, and killing. At this moment, every young man in the continental Europe learns the lesson of absolute military obedience and feels himself subject to this crushing power of militant society against which no rights of the individual to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness avail anything. This pernicious influence inherent in the social organization of all continental Europe during many centuries, the American people have for generations escaped and they show other nations how to escape it. I ask your attention to the favorable conditions under which this contribution of the United States to civilization has been made. There has been a deal of fighting on the American continent during the past three centuries, but it has not been of the sort which most imperils liberty. The first European colonists who occupied portions of the coast of North America encountered in the Indians men of the Stone Age, who ultimately had to be resisted and quelled by force. The Indian races were at the stage of development thousands of years behind that of the Europeans. They could not be assimilated. For the most part, they could not be taught or even reasoned with. With a few exceptions, they had to be driven away by prolonged fighting or subdued by force so that they would live peacefully with the whites. This warfare, however, has always had it in for the whites a large element of self-defense. The homes and families of the settlers were to be defended against a stealthily pitiless foe. Constant exposure to the attacks of savages was only one of the formidable dangers and difficulties which for a hundred years the early settlers had to meet and which developed in them courage, hardiness, and persistence. The French and English wars in the North American continent, always more or less mixed with Indian warfare, were characterized by race hatred and religious animosity, two of the commonest causes of war in all ages. But they did not tend to fasten upon the English colonists any objectionable public authority or to contract the limits of individual liberty. They furnished a school of martial qualities at small cost to liberty. In the War of Independence, there was a distinct hope and purpose to enlarge individual liberty. It made possible a confederation of the colonies and ultimately the adoption of the Constitution of the United States. It gave to the 13 colonies a lesson in collectivism, but it was a needed lesson on the necessity of combining their forces to resist an oppressive external authority. The War of 1812 is properly called the Second War of Independence, for it was truly a fight for liberty and for the rights of neutrals, in resistance of the impressment of seamen and other oppressions growing out of European conflicts. The Civil War of 1861 to 1865 was way on the side of the North, primarily to prevent the dismemberment of the country, and secondarily and incidentally to destroy the institution of slavery. On the northern side, it therefore called a generous element of popular ardor in defense of free institutions, and though it temporarily caused centralization of great powers in the government, it did as much to promote individual freedom as it did to strengthen public authority. In all this series of fightings, the main motives were self-defense, 
resistance to oppression, the enlargement of liberty, and the conservation of national acquisitions. The war with Mexico, it is true, was of a wholly different type. This was a war of conquest, and of conquest chiefly in the interest of African slavery. It was also an unjust attack made by a powerful people on a feeble one, but it lasted less than two years, and the number of men engaged in it was at no time large. Moreover, by the treaty which ended the war, the conquering nation agreed to pay the conquered $18 million in partial compensation for some of the territory wrested from it instead of demanding a huge war indemnity, as the European way is. Its results contradicted the anticipations both of those who advocated and of those who opposed it. It was one of the wrongs which prepared the way for the Great Rebellion, but its direct evils were of moderate extent, and it had no effect on the perennial conflict between individual liberty and public power. In the meantime, Partly as a result of Indian fighting and the Mexican War, but chiefly through purchases and arbitrations, the American people had acquired a territory so extensive, so defended by oceans, gulfs, and great lakes, and so intersected by those great natural highways, navigable rivers, that it would obviously be impossible for any enemy to overrun or subdue it. The civilized nations of Europe, Western Asia, and Northern Africa have always been liable to hostile incursions from without. Over and over again, barbarous hordes have overthrown established civilizations, and at this moment there is not a nation of Europe which does not feel obliged to maintain monstrous armaments for defense against its neighbors. The American people have long been exempt from such terrors, and now absolutely free from this necessity of keeping in readiness to meet heavy assaults. The absence of a great standing army and of a large fleet has been a main characteristic of the United States, in contrast with the other civilized nations. This has been a great inducement to immigration and a prime cause of the country's rapid increase in wealth. The United States have no formidable neighbor except Great Britain and Canada. In April 1817, by a convention made between Great Britain and the United States, without much public discussion or observation, these two powerful nations agreed that each should keep on the Great Lakes only a few police vessels of insignificant size and armament. This argument was made but four years after Perry's naval victory on Lake Erie, and only three years after the burning of Washington by a British force. It was one of the first acts of Monroe's first administration, and it would be difficult to find in all history a more judicious and effectual agreement between two powerful neighbors. For 80 years, this beneficent convention has helped to keep the peace. The European way would have been to build competitive fleets, dockyards, and fortresses, all of which have helped to bring on war during the periods of mutual exasperation which have occurred since 1817. Monroe's second administration was signalized six years later, by the declaration that the United States would consider any attempt on the part of the Holy Alliance to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to the peace and safety of the United States. This announcement was designed to prevent the introduction of the American continent of the horrible European system, with its balance of power, its alliances offensive and defensive in opposing groups, and its perpetual armaments on an enormous scale. That a declaration expressly intended to promote peace and prevent armaments should now be perverted into an argument for arming and for a belligerent public policy is an extraordinary perversion of the true American doctrine. The ordinary causes of war between nation and nation have been lacking in America for the last century and a quarter. How many wars in the world's history have been due to contending dynasties? How many of the most cruel and protracted wars have been due to religious strife? How many to race hatred? No one of these causes of war has been efficacious in America since the French were overcome in Canada by the English in 1759. Looking forward into the future, we find it impossible to imagine circumstances under which any of these common causes of war can take effect on the North American continent. Therefore, the ordinary motives for maintaining armaments and time of peace and concentrating the powers of government in such a way as to interfere with individual liberty have not been in play in the United States as among the nations of Europe and are not likely to be. Such have been favorable conditions under which America has made its best contribution to the progress of our race. There are some people of a perverted sentimentality who occasionally lament the absence in our country of the ordinary inducements to war on the ground that war develops certain noble qualities in some of the combatants and gives opportunity for the practice of heroic virtues such as courage, loyalty, and self-sacrifice. 
It is further said that prolonged peace makes nations effeminate, luxurious, and materialistic, and substitutes for the high ideals of the patriot soldier the low ideals of the farmer, manufacturer, tradesman, and pleasure seeker. This view seems to me to err in two opposite ways. In the first place, it forgets that war, in spite of the fact that it develops some splendid virtues, is the most horrible occupation that human beings can possibly engage in. It is cruel, treacherous, and murderous. Defensive warfare, particularly on the part of a weak nation against powerful invaders or oppressors, excites a generous sympathy. But for every heroic defense, there must be an attack by a preponderating force, and war being the conflict of the two must be judged by its moral effects not on one party but on both parties moreover the weaker party may have the worst cause the immediate ill effects of war are bad enough but its after effects are generally worse because indefinitely prolonged and indefinitely wasting and damaging at this moment, 31 years after the end of the Civil War, there are two great evils afflicting our country, which took their rise in that war, namely the belief of a portion of our people in money without intrinsic value, or worth less than its face, and made current solely by the act of Congress and the payment of immense annual sums and pensions. It is the paper money delusion born of the Civil War which generated and supports the silver money delusion of today. As a consequence of the war, the nation has paid two trillion dollars in pensions within 33 years. So far as pensions are paid to disabled persons, they are a just and inevitable but unproductive expenditure. So far as they are paid to persons who are not disabled, men or women, they are in the main not only unproductive but demoralizing, so far as they promote the marriage of young women to old men as pecuniary speculation, they create a grave social evil. It is impossible to compute or even imagine the losses and injuries already inflicted by the fiat money delusion, and we know that some of the worst evils of the pension system will go on for a hundred years to come, unless the laws about widows' pension are changed for the better. It is a significant fact that of the existing pensioners of the War of 1812, only 21 are surviving soldiers or sailors, while 3,826 are widows. War gratifies or used to gratify the combative instinct of mankind, but it gratifies also the level of plunder, destruction, cruel discipline, and arbitrary power. It is doubtful whether fighting with modern appliances will continue to gratify the savage instinct of combat, for it is not likely that in the future two opposing lines of men can ever meet, or any line or column reach an enemy's entrenchments. The machine gun can only be compared to the Sith, which cuts off every blade of the grass within its sweep. It has made cavalry charges impossible, just as the modern ironclad has made impossible the maneuvers of one of Nelson's fleets. On land, the only mode of approach of one line to another must hereafter be by concealment, crawling, or surprise. Naval actions will henceforth be conflicts between opposing machines, guided, to be sure, by men, but it will be the best machine that wins, and not necessarily the most enduring men. War will become a contest between treasuries or war chests, for now that 10,000 men can fire away a million dollars worth of ammunition in an hour, no poor nation can long resist a rich one, unless there be some extraordinary difference between the two in mental and moral strength. The view that war is desirable omits also the consideration that modern social and industrial life affords ample opportunities for the courageous and loyal discharge of duty apart from the barbarities of warfare. There are many serviceable occupations in civil life which call for all the courage and fidelity of the best soldier, and for more of his independent responsibility because not pursued in masses or under the immediate command of superiors. Such occupations are those of the locomotive engineer, the electric line the railroad brakeman, the city fireman, and the policeman. The occupation of a locomotive engineer requires constantly a high degree of skill, alertness, fidelity, and resolution, and at any moment may call for heroic self-forgetfulness. The occupation of a lineman requires all the courage and endurance of a soldier whose lurking foe is mysterious and invisible. In the two years, 1893 and 1894, there were 34,000 trainmen killed and wounded on the railroads of the United States and 25,000 other railroad employees besides. I need not enlarge on the dangers of the fireman's occupation or on the disciplined gallantry with which its risks are habitually incurred. 
The policeman in large cities needs every virtue of the best soldier, for in the discharge of many of its most important duties he is alone. Even the female occupation of the trained nurse illustrates every heroic quality which can possibly be exhibited in war, for she, simply in the way of duty, without the stimulus of excitement or companionship, runs risks from which many a soldier in hot blood would shrink. No one need be anxious about the lack of opportunities in civilized life for the display of heroic qualities. New industries demand new forms of fidelity and self-sacrificing devotion. Every generation develops some new kind of hero. Did it ever occur to you that the scab is a credible type of 19th century hero? In defense of his rights as an individual, he deliberately incurs the reprobation of many of his fellows and runs the immediate risk of bodily injury or even of death. He also risks his livelihood for the future, and thereby the well-being of his family. He steadily asserts in action his right to work on such conditions as he sees fit to make, and, in so doing, he exhibits remarkable courage and renders a great service to his fellow men. He is generally a quiet, unpretending, silent person who values his personal freedom more than the society and approbation of his mates. Often he is impelled to work by family affection, and this fact does not diminish his heroism. There are file closers behind the line of battle of the bravest regiment. Another modern personage who needs heroic endurance and often exhibits it is a public servant who steadily does his duty against the outcry of a party press bent on perverting his every word and act. Through the telegram, cheap postage, and the daily newspaper, the forces of hasty public opinion can now be concentrated and expressed within a rapidity and intensity unknown to preceding generations. In consequence, the independent thinker or actor, or the public servant, when his thoughts or acts run counter to prevailing popular or party opinions, encounters sudden and intense obloquy, which to many temperaments is very formidable. That habit of submitting to the opinion of the majority which democracy fosters renders the storm of detraction and culminy all the more difficult to endure, makes it, indeed, so intolerable to many citizens that they will conceal or modify their opinions rather than endure it. Yet the very breath of life for a democracy is free discussion and the taking account of all opinions honestly held and reasonably expressed. The unreality of the vilification of public men in the modern press is often revealed by the sudden change when an eminent public servant retires or dies. A man for whom no words of derision or condemnation were strong enough yesterday is recognized tomorrow as an honorable and serviceable person and a credit to his country. Nevertheless, this habit of partisan ridicule and denunciation in the daily reading matter of millions of people calls for a new kind of courage and toughness in public men, and calls for it not in brief moments of excitement only, but steadily year in and year out. Clearly, there is no need of bringing on wars in order to breed heroes. Civilized life affords plenty of opportunities for heroes, and for a better kind than war or any other savagery has ever produced. Moreover, none but lunatics would set a city on fire in order to give opportunities for heroism to firemen, or introduce the cholera or yellow fever to give physicians and nurses opportunity for practicing disinterested devotion, or condemn thousands of people to extreme poverty in order that some well-to-do persons might practice a beautiful charity. It is equally crazy to advocate war on the ground that it is a school for heroes. Another misleading argument for war needs brief notice. It is said that a war is a school of national development, that a nation, when conducting a great war, puts forth prodigious exertions to raise money, supply munitions, enlist troops, and keep them in the field, and often gets a clearer conception and a better control of its own material and moral forces while making these unusual exertions. The nation which means to live in peace necessarily forgoes, it is said, these valuable opportunities of abnormal activity. Naturally, such a nation's abnormal activities devoted to destruction would be diminished, but its normal and abnormal activities devoted to construction and improvement ought to increase. One great reason for the rapid development of the United States since the adoption of the Constitution is the comparative exemption of the whole people from war, dread of war, and preparations for war. The energies of the people have been directed into other channels. 
the progress of applied science during the present century and the new ideals concerning the well-being of human multitudes have opened great fields for the useful application of national energy. This immense territory of ours, stretching from ocean to ocean, and for the most part but imperfectly developed and sparsely settled, affords a broad field for the beneficent application of the richest national forces during an indefinite period. There is no department of national activity in which we would not advantageously put forth much more force than we now expend, and there are great fields which we have never cultivated at all. As examples, I may mention the post office, national sanitation, public works, and education. Although great improvements have been made during the past 50 years in the collection and delivery of mail matter, much still remains to be done both in city and country, and particularly in the country. In the mail facilities secured to our people, we are far behind several European governments, whereas we ought to be far in advance of every European government except Switzerland, since the rapid interchange of ideas and the promotion of family, friendly, and commercial intercourse are of more importance to a democracy than to any other form of political society. Our national government takes very little pains about the sanitation of the country or its deliverance from injurious insects and parasites, yet these are matters of gravest interest with which only the government can deal, because action by separate states or cities is necessarily ineffectual. To fight pestilences needs quite as much energy, skill, and courage as to carry on war. Indeed, the foes are more insidious and awful, and the means of resistance less obvious. On the average and the large scale, the professions which heal and prevent disease and mitigate suffering call for much more ability, constancy, and devotion than the professions which inflict wounds and death of all sorts of human misery. Our government has never touched the important subject of national roads, by which I mean not railroads, but common highways. Yet here is a great subject for beneficent action throughout government, in which we need only go for our lessons to little Republican Switzerland. Inundations and droughts are great enemies of the human race, against which government ought to create defenses because private enterprise cannot cope with such widespreading evils. Popular education is another great field in which public activity should be indefinitely enlarged, not so much through the action of the federal government, though even there a much more effective supervision should be provided than now exists, but through the action of states, cities, and towns. We have hardly begun to apprehend the fundamental necessity and infinite value of public education or to appreciate the immense advantages to be derived from additional expenditure for it. What prodigious possibilities of improvement are suggested by the single statement that the average annual expenditure for the schooling of a child in the United States is only about $18. Here is a cause which requires from hundreds of thousands of men and women keen intelligence, hearty devotion to duty, and a steady uplifting and advancement of all its standards and ideals. The system of public instruction should embody for coming generations all the virtues of the medieval church. It should stand for the brotherhood and unity of all classes and conditions. It should exalt the joys of the intellectual life above all material delights, and it should produce the best constituted and most wisely directed intellectual and moral host that the world has seen. In view of such unutilized opportunities as these for the beneficent application of great public forces, does it not seem monstrous that war should be advocated on the ground that it gives occasion for rallying and using the national energies? The second eminent contribution which the United States have made to civilization is there through acceptance, in theory and practice, of the widest religious toleration. As a means of suppressing individual liberty, the collective authority of the church, when elaborately organized in a hierarchy directed by one head and absolutely devoted in every rank to its service, comes next in proved efficiency to that concentration of powers in government which enables it to carry on war effectively. The Western Christian Church, organized under the Bishop of Rome, acquired, during the Middle Ages, a centralized authority which quite overrode both the temporal ruler and the rising spirit of nationality. For a time, Christian church and Christian states acted together, just as in Europe, during many earlier centuries. The great powers of civil and religious rule have been united. The Crusades marked the climax of the power of the church. Therefore, church and state were often in conflict, and during this prolonged conflict the seeds of liberty were planted, 
took root and made some steady growth. We can see now as we look back on the history of Europe how fortunate it was that the colonization of North America by Europeans was deferred until after the period of the Reformation, and especially until after the Elizabethan period in England, the Luther period in Germany, and the splendid struggle of the Dutch for liberty in Holland. The founders of New England and New York were men who had imbibed the principles of resistance both to arbitrary civil power and to universal ecclesiastical authority. Hence it came about that within the territory now covered by the United States, no single ecclesiastical organization ever obtained a wide and oppressive control, and that in different parts of this great region churches, very unlike in doctrine and organization, were almost simultaneously established. It has been an inevitable consequence of this condition of things that the church as a whole in the United States has not been an effective opponent of any form of human rights. For generations it has been divided into numerous sects and denominations, no one of which has been able to claim more than a tenth of the population as its adherents, and the practices of these numerous denominations have been profoundly modified by political theories and practices and by social customs natural to new communities formed under the prevailing conditions of free intercourse and rapid growth. The constitutional prohibition of religious tests as qualifications for office gave the United States the leadership among the nations in disassociating theological opinions and political rights. No one denomination or ecclesiastical organization in the United States has held great properties or has had the means of conducting its ritual with costly pomp or its charitable works with imposing liberality. No splendid architectural exhibitions of church power have interested or overawed the population. On the contrary, there has prevailed in general a great simplicity in public worship until very recent years. Some splendors have been lately developed by religious bodies in the great cities, but these splendors and luxuries have been almost simultaneously exhibited by the religious bodies of very different, not to say opposite, kinds. Thus, in New York City, the Jews, the Greek Church, the Catholics, and the Episcopalians have all erected or undertaken to erect magnificent edifices. But these recent demonstrations of wealth and zeal are so distributed among differing religious organizations that they cannot be imagined to indicate a coming centralization of ecclesiastical influence adverse to individual liberty. In the United States, the great principle of religious toleration is better understood and more firmly established than in any other nation of the earth. It is not only embodied in legislation, but also completely recognized in the habits and customs of good society. Elsewhere, it may be a long road from legal to social recognition of religious liberty, as the example of England shows. This recognition alone would mean to any competent student of history that the United States had made an unexampled contribution to the reconciliation of just governmental power with just freedom for the individual, and as much as the partial establishment of religious toleration has been the main work of civilization during the past four centuries. In view of this characteristic and an infinitely beneficent contribution to human happiness and progress, how pitiable seem the temporary outbursts of bigotry and fanaticism, which have occasionally marred the fair record of our country in regard to religious toleration. If anyone imagines that this American contribution to civilization is no longer important, that the victory for toleration has been already won, let him recall the fact that the last years of the 19th century have witnessed two horrible religious persecutions, one by a Christian nation, the other by a Muslim, one of the Jews by Russia, and the other of the Armenians by Turkey. The third characteristic contribution which the United States have made to civilization has been the safe development of a manhood suffrage nearly universal. The experience of the United States has brought out several principles with regard to the suffrage which have not been clearly apprehended by some eminent political philosophers. In the first place, American experience has demonstrated the advantages of a gradual approach to universal suffrage over a sudden leap. Universal suffrage is not the first and only means of attaining democratic government. Rather, it is the ultimate goal of successful democracy. It is not a specific for the cure of all political ills, 
On the contrary, it may itself easily be the source of great political evils. The people of the United States feel its dangers today when constituencies are large. It aggravates the well-known difficulties of party government, so that many of the ills which threaten democratic communities at this moment, whether in Europe or America, proceed from the breakdown of party government rather than from failures of universal suffrage. The methods of party government were elaborated where suffrage was limited and constituencies were small. Manhood suffrage has not worked perfectly well in the United States or in any other nation where it has been adopted, and it is not likely very soon to work perfectly anywhere. It is like freedom of the will for the individual, the only atmosphere in which virtue can grow, but an atmosphere in which sin can also grow. Like freedom of the will, it needs to be surrounded with checks and safeguards, particularly in the childhood of the nation, but, like the freedom of the will, it is the supreme good, the goal of perfected democracy. Secondly, like freedom of the will, universal suffrage has an educational effect, which has been mentioned by many writers but has seldom been clearly apprehended or adequately described. This educational effect is produced in two ways. In the first place, the combination of individual freedom with social mobility, which a wide suffrage tends to produce, permits the capable to rise through all grades of society, even within a single generation, and this freedom to rise is intensely stimulating to personal ambition. Thus, every capable American, from youth to age, is bent on bettering himself in his condition. Nothing can be more striking than the contrast between the mental condition of an average American belonging to laborious classes, but conscious that he can rise to the top of the social scale, and that of a European mechanic peasant or tradesman who knows that he cannot rise out of his class and is content with his hereditary classification. The state of mind of the American prompts to constant struggle for self-improvement and the acquisition of all sorts of property and power. In the second place, it is a direct effect of a broad suffrage that the voters become periodically interested in the discussion of grave public problems, which carry their minds away from the routine of their daily labor and household experience out into larger fields. The instrumentalities of this prolonged education have been multiplied and improved enormously within the last 50 years. In no field of human endeavor have the fruits of the introduction of steam and electrical power been more striking than the methods of reaching multitudes of people with instructive narratives, expositions, and arguments. The multiplication of newspapers, magazines, and books is only one of the immense developments in the means of reaching the people. The advocates of any public cause now have it in their power to provide hundreds of papers with the same copy or the same plates for simultaneous issue. The mails provide the means of circulating millions of leaflets and pamphlets. The interest in the minds of the people which prompts to the reading of these multiplied communications comes from the frequently recurring elections. The more difficult the intellectual problem presented in any given election, the more educative the effect of the discussion. Many modern industrial and financial problems are extremely difficult, even for highly educated men. As subjects of earnest thought and discussion on the farm, and in the workshop, factory, rolling mill, and mine, they supply a mental training for millions of adults, the like of which has never before been seen in the world. In these discussions, it is not only the receptive masses that are benefited. The classes that supply the appeals to the masses are also benefited in a high degree. There is no better mental exercise for the most highly trained man than the effort to expound a difficult subject in so clear a way that the untrained man can understand it. In a republic in which the final appeal is to manhood suffrage, the educated minority of the people is constantly stimulated to exertion by the instinct of self-preservation as well as by love of country. They see dangers and proposals made to universal suffrage, and they must exert themselves to ward off those dangers. The position of the educated and well-to-do classes is a thoroughly wholesome one in this respect. They cannot depend for the preservation of their advantages on land-owning, hereditary privilege, or any legislation not equally applicable to the poorest and humblest citizen. They must maintain their superiority by being superior. They cannot live in a too safe corner. I touch here on a misconception which underlies much of the criticism of universal suffrage. It is commonly said that the rule of the majority must be the rule of the most ignorant and incapable, the multitude being necessarily uninstructed as to taxation, public finance, and foreign relations, and untrained to active thought on such difficult subjects. 
Now, universal suffrage is merely a convention as to where the last appeal shall lie for the decision of public questions, and it is the rule of the majority only in this sense. The educated classes are undoubtedly a minority, but it is not safe to assume that they monopolize the good sense of the community. On the contrary, it is very clear that native good judgment and good feeling are not proportional to education, and that among a multitude of men who have only an elementary education, a large proportion will possess both good judgment and good feeling. Indeed, persons who can neither read nor write may possess a large share of both, as is constantly seen in regions where the opportunities for education and childhood have been scanty or inaccessible. It is not to be supposed that the cultivated classes under a regime of universal suffrage are not going to try to make their cultivation felt in the discussion and disposal of public questions. Any result under universal suffrage is a complex effect of the discussion of the public question in hand by the educated classes in the presence of the comparatively uneducated, when a majority of both classes taken together is ultimately to settle a question. In practice, both classes divide on almost every issue. But, in any case, if the educated classes cannot hold their own with the uneducated, by means of their superior physical, mental, and moral qualities, they are obviously unfit to lead society. With education should come better powers of argument and persuasion, a stricter sense of honor. With education should come better powers of argument and persuasion, a stricter sense of honor, and a greater general effectiveness. With these advantages, the educated classes must undoubtedly appeal to the less educated and try to convert them to their way of thinking. But this is a process which is good for both sets of people. Indeed, it is the best possible process for the training of freemen, educated or uneducated, rich or poor. It is often assumed that the educated classes become impotent in a democracy because the representatives of these classes are not exclusively chosen to public office. This argument is a very fallacious one. It assumes that the public offices are the places of greatest influence, whereas in the United States at least, that is conspicuously not the case. In a democracy, it is important to discriminate influence from authority. Rulers and magistrates may or may not be the persons of influence, but many persons of influence never become rulers, magistrates, or representatives in parliaments or legislatures. The complex industries of a modern state and its innumerable corporation services offer great fields for administrative talent which were entirely unknown to preceding generations, and these new activities attract many ambitious and capable men more strongly than the public service. These men are not on in which the final appeal is to manhood suffrage. The educated minority of these people is constantly stimulated to exertion by the instinct of self-preservation as well as by love of country. They see dangers and proposals made to universal suffrage, and they must exert themselves to ward off those dangers. The position of the educated and the well-to-do classes is a thoroughly wholesome one in its respect. They cannot depend for the preservation of their advantages on land-owning, hereditary privilege, or any legislation not equally applicable to the poorest and humblest citizen. They must maintain their superiority by being superior. They cannot live in a too safe corner. I touch here on a misconception which underlies much of the criticism of universal suffrage. It is commonly said that the rule of the majority must be the rule of the most ignorant and incapable, the multitude being necessarily uninstructed as to taxation, public finance, and foreign relations, and untrained to active thought on such difficult subjects. Now, universal suffrage is merely a convention as to where the last appeal shall lie for the decision of public questions, and it is the rule of the majority only in this sense. The educated classes are undoubtedly a minority, but it is not safe to assume that they monopolize the good sense of the community. On the contrary, it is very clear that native good judgment and good feeling are not proportional to education, and that among a multitude of men who have only an elementary education, a large proportion will possess both good judgment and good feeling. Indeed, persons who can neither read nor write may possess a large share of both, as is constantly seen in regions where the opportunities for education and childhood have been scanty or inaccessible. 
It is not to be supposed that the cultivated classes under a regime of universal suffrage are not going to try to make their cultivation felt in the discussion and disposal of public questions. Any result under universal suffrage is a complex effect of the discussion of the public question in hand by the educated classes in the presence of the comparatively uneducated, when a majority of both classes taken together is ultimately to settle a question. In practice, both classes divide on almost every issue. But, in any case, if the educated classes cannot hold their own with the uneducated, by means of their superior physical, mental, and moral qualities, they are obviously unfit to lead society. With education should come better powers of argument and persuasion, a stricter sense of honor. With education should come better powers of argument and persuasion, a stricter sense of honor, and a greater general effectiveness. With these advantages, the educated classes must undoubtedly appeal to the less educated and try to convert them to their way of thinking. But this is a process which is good for both sets of people. Indeed, it is the best possible process for the training of freemen, educated or uneducated, rich or poor. It is often assumed that the educated classes become impotent in a democracy because the representatives of these classes are not exclusively chosen to public office. This argument is a very fallacious one. It assumes that the public offices are the places of greatest influence, whereas in the United States at least, that is conspicuously not the case. In a democracy, it is important to discriminate influence from authority. Rulers and magistrates may or may not be the persons of influence, but many persons of influence never become rulers, magistrates, or representatives in parliaments or legislatures. The complex industries of a modern state and its innumerable corporation services offer great fields for administrative talent which were entirely unknown to preceding generations, and these new activities attract many ambitious and capable men more strongly than the public service. These men are not on that account lost to their country or to society. The present generation has wholly escaped from the conditions of earlier centuries when able men who were not great landowners but had three outlets for their ambition, the army, the church, or the national civil service. The national service, whether in an empire, a limited monarchy, or a republic, is now only one of the many fields which offer to able and patriotic men an honorable and successful career. Indeed, legislation and public administration necessarily have a very second-hand quality, and more and more legislators and administrators become dependent on the researches of scholars, men of science, and historians, and follow in the footsteps of inventors, economists, and political philosophers. Political leaders are very seldom leaders of thought. They are generally trying to induce masses of men to act on principles thought out long before. Their skill is in the selection of practicable approximations to the ideal. Their arts are arts of exposition and persuasion. Their honor comes from fidelity under trying circumstances to familiar principles of public duty. The real leaders of American thought in this century have been preachers, teachers, jurists, seers, and poets. While it is of the highest importance under any form of government that the public servants should be men of intelligence, education, and honor, it is no objection to any given form that under its large numbers of educated and honorable citizens have no connection with the public service. Well-to-do Europeans, when reasoning about the working of democracy, often assume that under any government the property holders are synonymous with the intelligent and educated class. That is not the case in the American democracy. Anyone who has been connected with a large American university can testify that democratic institutions produce plenty of rich people who are not educated and plenty of educated people who are not rich, just as medieval society produced illiterate nobles and cultivated monks. Persons who object to manhood suffrage as a last resort for the settlement of public questions are bound to show where, in all the world, a juster or more practicable regulation or convention has been arrived at. The objectors ought at least to indicate where the ultimate decision should, in their judgment, rest, as, for example, with the landowners or the property holders or the graduates of secondary schools or the professional classes. He would be a bold political philosopher who, in these days, should propose that the ultimate tribunal should be constituted in any of these ways. All the experience of the civilized world fails to indicate a safe personage, a safe class, or a safe minority with which to deposit this power of ultimate decision. On the contrary, 
the experience of civilization indicates that no select person or class can be trusted with that power, no matter what the principle of selection. The convention that the majority of males shall decide public questions has obviously great recommendations. It is apparently fairer than the rule of any minority, and it is sure to be supported by an adequate physical force. Moreover, its decisions are likely to enforce themselves. Even in matters of doubtful prognostication, the fact that a majority of the males do the prophesying tends to the fulfillment of the prophecy. At any rate, the adoption or partial adoption of universal male suffrage by several civilized nations as coincident with unexampled ameliorations in the condition of the least fortunate and most numerous classes of the population. To this general amelioration many causes have doubtless contributed, but it is reasonable to suppose that the acquisition of the power which comes with votes had something to do with it. Timid or conservative people often stand aghast at the possible directions of democratic desire or at some of the predicated results of democratic rule. But meantime, the actual experience of the American democracy proves, one, that property has never been safer under any form of government, two, that no people have ever welcomed so ardently new machinery and new inventions generally, three, that religious toleration was never carried so far and never so universally accepted, four, that nowhere have the power and disposition have been read so general, five, that nowhere has government power been more adequate or more freely exercised to levy and collect taxes, to raise armies and to disband them, to maintain public order and to pay off great public debts, national, state, and town, six, that nowhere have property and well-being been so widely diffused, and seven, that no form of government ever inspired greater affection and loyalty or prompted to greater personal sacrifices in supreme moments. In view of these solid facts, speculations as to what universal suffrage would have done in the 17th and 18th centuries, or may do in the 20th, seem futile indeed. The most civilized nations of the world have all either adopted this final appeal to manhood suffrage, or they are approaching that adoption by rapid stages. The United States, having no customs or traditions of any opposite sort to overcome, have led the nations in this direction and have had the honor of devising, as a result of practical experience, the best safeguards for universal suffrage, safeguards which, in the main, are intended to prevent hasty public action or action based on sudden discontents or temporary spasms of public feeling. These checks are intended to give time for discussion and deliberation or, in other words, to secure the enlightenment of the voters before the vote. If, under new conditions, existing safeguards prove insufficient, the only wise course is to devise new safeguards. The United States have made to civilization a fourth contribution of a very hopeful sort to which public attention needs to be directed. Less temporary evils connected therewith should prevent the continuation of this beneficent action. The United States have furnished a demonstration that people belonging to a great variety of races or nations are, under favorable circumstances, fit for political freedom. It is the fashion to attribute to the enormous immigration of the last 50 years some of the failures of the American political system, and particularly the American failure in municipal government and the introduction in a few states of the rule of the irresponsible party foremen known as bosses. Impatient of these evils and hastily accepting this improbable explanation of them, some people wish to depart from the American policy of welcoming immigrants. In two respects, the absorption of large numbers of immigrants from many nations in the American Commonwealth has been of great service to mankind. In the first place, it has demonstrated that people who at home have been subject to every sort of aristocratic or despotic or military oppression become within less than a generation serviceable citizens of a republic and, in the second place, the United States have thus educated to freedom many millions of men Furthermore, the comparatively high degree of happiness and prosperity enjoyed by the people of the United States has been brought home to multitudes in Europe by friends and relatives who have emigrated to this country and has commended free institutions to them in the best possible way. This is a legitimate propaganda vastly more effective than any annexation or conquest of unwilling people or of people unprepared for liberty. It is a great mistake to suppose that the process of assimilating foreigners began in this century. 
The 18th century provided the colonies with a great mixture of peoples, although the English race predominated then as now. When the revolution broke out, there were already English, Irish, Scotch, Dutch, Germans, French, Portuguese, and Swedes in the colonies. The French were, to be sure, in small proportion and were almost exclusively Huguenot refugees, but they were a valuable element in the population. The Germans were well diffused, having established themselves in New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Georgia. The Scotch were scattered through all the colonies. Pennsylvania especially was inhabited by an extraordinary mixture of nationalities and religions. Since steam navigation on the Atlantic and railroad transportation of the North American continent became cheap and easy, the tide of immigration has greatly increased, but it is very doubtful if the amount of assimilation going on in the 19th century has been any larger in proportion to the population and wealth of the country than it was in the 18th. The main difference in the assimilation going on in the two centuries is this that in the 18th century the newcomers were almost all Protestants, while in the 19th century a considerable proportion have been Catholics. One result, however, of the importation of large numbers of Catholics in the United States has been a profound modification of the Roman Catholic Church in regard to the manners and customs of both the clergy and the laity, the scope of the authority of the priest, and the attitude of the Catholic Church toward the public education. This American modification of the Roman Church has reacted strongly on the Church in Europe. Another great contribution to civilization made by the United States is the diffusion of material well-being among the population. No country in the world approaches the United States in this respect. It is seen in that diffused elementary education which implants for life a habit of reading and in the habitual optimism which characterizes the common people. It is seen in the housing of the people and their domestic animals, in the comparative costliness of their food, clothing, and household furniture, in their implements, vehicles, and means of transportation, and in the substitution, on a prodigious scale, of the work of machinery for the work of men's hands. This last item in American well-being is quite as striking in agriculture, mining, and fishing as it is in manufactures. The social effects of the manufacture of power and the discovery of means of putting that power just where it is wanted have been more striking in the United States than anywhere else. Manufactured and distributed power needs intelligence to direct it. The bicycle is a blind horse and must be steered at every instant. Somebody must show a steam drill where to strike and how deep to go. So far as men and women can substitute for the direct expenditure of muscular strength, the more intelligent form of designing, tending, and guiding machines, they win promotion in the scale of being and make their lives more interesting as well as more productive. It is in the invention of machinery for producing and distributing power and at once economizing and elevating human labor that American ingenuity has been most conspicuously manifested. The high price of labor in a sparsely settled country has had something to do with this striking result, but the genius of the people and of their government has had much more to do with it. As proof of the general proposition, it suffices merely to mention the telegraph and telephone, the sewing machine, the cotton gin, the mower, reaper, the threshing machine, the dishwashing machine, the river steamboat, the sleeping car, the boot and shoe machinery, and the watch machinery. The ultimate effects of these and kindred inventions are quite as much intellectual as physical, and they are developing and increasing with a proportionate rapidity which sometimes suggested doubt whether the bodily forces of men and women are adequate to resist the new mental strains brought upon them. However, this may prove to be in the future the clear result in the present as an unexampled diffusion of well-being in the United States. These five contributions to civilization, peacekeeping, religious toleration, the development of manhood suffrage, the welcoming of newcomers, and the diffusion of well-being, I hold to have been eminently characteristic of our country, and so important that, in spite of the qualifications and deductions which every candid citizen would admit with regard to every one of them, they will ever be held in the grateful remembrance of mankind. They are reasonable grounds for a steady glowing patriotism. They have had much to do, both as causes and as effects, with the material prosperity of the United States, but they are all five essentially moral contributions, being triumphs of reason, enterprise, courage, faith, and justice, over passion, selfishness, inertness, timidity, and distrust. 
Beneath each one of these developments, there lies a strong ethical sentiment, a strenuous and moral social purpose. It is for such work that multitudinous democracies are fit. In regard to all five of these contributions, the characteristic policy of our country has been from time to time threatened with reversal, is even now so threatened. It is for true patriots to insist on the maintenance of these historic purposes and policies of the people of the United States. Our country's future perils, whether already visible or still unimagined, are to be met with courage and constancy, founded firmly on these popular achievements in the past. End of Five American Contributions to Civilization by Charles William Eliot, read by Andrea Dion. Goldfish by A. A. Milne, from Not That It Matters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Let us talk about, well, anything you will. Goldfish, for instance. Goldfish are a symbol of old-world tranquility, or mid-Victorian futility, according to their position in the home. Outside the home, in that wild state from which civilization has dragged them, they may have stood for daredevil courage, or constancy, or devotion. I cannot tell. I may only speak of them now as I find them, which is in the garden, or in the drawing-room. In their lily-leaved pool, sunk deep in the old flagged terrace, upon whose borders the blackbird whistles his early morning song, they remind me of sundials and lavender and old delightful things. But in their cheap glass bowl upon the three-legged table, above which the cloth-covered canary maintains a stolid silence, they remind me of antimacassars and horsehair sofas and all that is depressing. It is hard that the goldfish himself should have so little choice in the matter. Goldfish look pretty in the terrace pond, yet I doubt if it was the need for prettiness which brought them there. Rather, the need for something to throw things to. No one of the initiate can sit in front of nature's most wonderful effect, the sea, without wishing to throw stones into it. The physical pleasure of the effort and the aesthetic pleasure of the splash combining to produce perfect contentment. So, by the margin of the pool, the same desires stir within one, and because ants' eggs do not splash, and look untidy on the surface of the water, there must be a gleam of gold and silver to put the crown upon one's pleasure. Perhaps when you have been feeding the goldfish you have not thought of it like that, but at least you must have wondered why, of all diets, they should prefer ants' eggs. Ants' eggs are, I should say, the very last thing which one would take to without argument. It must be an acquired taste, and this being so, one naturally asks oneself how goldfish came to acquire it. I suppose, but I am lamentably ignorant on these as on all other matters, that there was a time when goldfish lived a wild, free life of their own. They roamed the sea or the river, or whatever it was, fighting for existence, and nature showed them, as she always does, the food which suited them. Now I have often come across ants' nests in my travels, but never when swimming. In seas and rivers, pools and lakes I have wandered, but nature has never put ants' eggs in my way. No doubt it would be only right. The goldfish has a keener eye than I have for these things. But if they had been there, should I have missed them so completely? I think not, for if they had been there, they must have been there in great quantities. I can imagine a goldfish slowly acquiring the taste for them through the centuries, but only if other food were denied to him. Only if, wherever he went, ants' eggs, ants' eggs... Ants' eggs drifted down the stream to him. Yet, since it would seem that he has acquired the taste, it can only be that the taste has come to him with captivity, has been forced upon him, I should have said. The old wild goldfish, this is my theory, 
was a more terrible beast than we think. Given his proper diet, he should not have been kept within the limits of the terrace pool. He would have been unsuited to domestic life. He would have dragged in the shrieking child as she leant to feed him. As the result of many experiments, ants' eggs were given him to keep him thin. You can see for yourself what a bloodless diet it is. Ants' eggs were given him to quell his spirit. And just as a man, if he has sufficient colds, can get up a passion even for ammoniated quinine, so the goldfish has grown in captivity to welcome the once hated omelet. Let us consider now the case of the goldfish in the house. His diet is the same, but how different his surroundings. If his bowl is placed on a table in the middle of the floor, he has but to flash his tail once, and he has been all round the drawing room. The drawing room may not seem much to you, but to him, this impressionist picture through the curved glass must be amazing. Let not the outdoor goldfish boast of his freedom. What does he in his little world of water-lily roots know of the vista upon vista which opens to his more happy brother as he passes jauntily from China Dog to Ottoman and from Ottoman to Henry's father? Aha, here is life. It may be that in the course of years he will get used to it, even bored by it. Indeed, for that reason, I always advocate giving him a glance at the dining room or the bedrooms on Wednesdays and Saturdays, but his first day in the bowl must be the opening of an undreamt of heaven to him. Again, what an adventurous life is his. At any moment a cat may climb up and fetch him out. A child may upset him. Grown-ups may neglect to feed him or change his water. The temptation to take him up and massage him must be irresistible to outsiders. All these dangers the goldfish in the pond avoids. He lives a sheltered and unexciting life, and when he wants to die, he dies unnoticed, unregretted. But for his brother, the tears and the solemn funeral. Yes, now that I have thought it out, I can see that I was wrong in calling the indoor goldfish a symbol of mid-Victorian futility. An article of this sort is no good if it does not teach the writer something as well as his readers. I recognize him now as the symbol of enterprise and endurance, of restlessness and post-impressionism. He is not mid-Victorian, he is fifth Georgian, which is all I want to say about goldfish. End of Goldfish by A. A. Milne Read by John N. Daly The Handwriting on the Screen by Carl Schmidt From Everybody's Magazine, Volume 36, January to June, 1917 This recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. There are those who contend that the ideal screenplay will be acted from beginning to end without a single subtitle of comment or explanation. Douglas Fairbanks thinks differently. No sooner had he disposed of his court troubles, a suit for violation of contract, than he engaged at once an expert subtitle writer, Anita Luz, to do the scenarios for the pictures he is to bring out himself. Time and again, said Mr. Fairbanks. I have sat through plays with Miss Lewis and have heard the audience applaud her subtitles as heartily as the liveliest scenes. This has convinced me of the great value of the kind of work she does. Miss Lewis took up subtitle writing largely because it was found that her scenarios, when filmed or shot, as the movie phrase has it, had lost much of their originality. It was generally agreed that her scripts were better than the pictures they made. The scenario might seem to be unusual. The picture had less point. Bit by bit, parts of the scenarios found their way onto the screen as subtitles, and thus an incidental part of Miss Lou's work began to dominate. During the run of a famous pantomime, Backstage was said to have been made lively in the intermissions by the professional bickerings of performers whose work deprived them of speech. It was as if the actors 
needed this outlet for curbed tongues. Nor does the enforced silence of the screen make marionettes of the players who face the camera. Through their press agents, they not only talk much, but often in a new language. Most persons know something of this lingo of the studios. Many are familiar with the ghastly close-up and know that the director is a czar-like stage manager who can crush or create careers at will. Only to the initiated is it given to no continuity. Locations, cut-ins, dissolves, fade-outs, iris in, titles, and subtitles. The subtitle has only been in vogue a few years. It differs from the title, the wording between scenes, which describes the action of the picture that is to come, in that it need not attend to business. It is meant only for the audience, and though, at times, in the supposed speech of the characters in the film, it may be a mere comment outside the picture, and addressed to the audience like the aside of our father's theatre. Titles and subtitles get the undivided attention of the audience. Often, in the spoken drama, a humorous line is lost because of the distraction of many things. No one may miss lines on the screen. In The Birth of a Nation and in Intolerance, most of the trouble was caused by subtitles. A single one in the latter film, a paraphrase by Anita Luz of a quotation from Voltaire, caused a protest from the club women of Los Angeles and aroused Pennsylvania's easily agitated censors. Anita Luz has not only written subtitles for Griffith's pictures, but she has written many for Douglas Fairbanks' triumphant crusades against villainy. My most popular subtitle introduced the name of a new character, confessed Miss Luz. The name was something like this, Count Zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
since i have known something of the technical work i have been more than ever convinced of the great possibilities of the movies they have a wonderful future now they deal with trivialities they will outgrow that then i guess i'll ease out now i am never bored but i would be if the movies hadn't come along i lived in a small california town i couldn't get away though i threatened my parents with a runaway marriage as a means of seeing the world i had read every book in the town library when i had read all the english books i learned french and german so as to read the few foreign books that the library contained it's no credit to me if i am well read my reading has helped me in my writing though i read not for information nor for amusement but as flaubert counsels in one of his letters i read to live that a subtitle and scenario writer who has grown up with the movies should know voltaire and flaubert is surprising but then miss lewis is not the conventional moving picture subject for an interview End of The Handwriting on the Screen by Carl Schmidt Question and Answer Depart for the Broadcasting Program An Interview with Anita Luz by Paul S. Gaultier from The Wireless Age, 1922, Volume 10 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. An Interview with Anita Luz by Paul S. Gaultier. Few of the 2,500 or more daily newspapers in the United States are without question and answer departments. These at first catered to the lovesick youth. Either he was heartbroken because she did not smile and show her teeth, or it was she who had a quarrel after the barn dance and thought of writing to the all-knowing Mrs. Beeswax to secure advice on making up. Then there was a change in the type of such departments. The papers commenced to give their readers more genuine information on every conceivable subject. Ask a question and enclose a stamp. They shouted gloriously in the printed columns, and you'll get an answer. How old is Chauncey Depew? What makes the movies move? When is the next eclipse of the sun? And now there arises to ask, why this splendid feature of the dailies cannot be incorporated in the broadcasting programs a young woman whose name is or ought to be familiar to most of the thirty or forty millions of movie patrons of the country she is miss anita Luz, who with her husband mr john emerson writes scenarios miss Luz, or mrs emerson unquestionably is the highest paid woman writing original stories for the silent drama some newspaper correspondent at one time printed a story stating that the talented couple make a million dollars a year out of their writing but that was only a flight of fancy the reason i mention the tale is to impress in a forcible way the fact that miss luce is at the top of her profession and for that reason a suggestion from her is to be listened to attentively not alone is the motion picture audience acquainted with miss Luce, the radio public also is for she has talked over the air giving a lengthy and instructive discussion on the art of writing movie scenarios i met miss Luce in her apartment at the savoy hotel in new york city while she was stopping there immediately after her return from europe where she had been during the summer. The topic of conversation, of course, turned to radio and how it may, or will, be used in connection with motion pictures. It would seem to me, she said, as she curled up in a huge plush chair, that its most valuable function now would be to educate the public further in the inside workings of the motion picture industry you have no idea of the thousands of men women and even boys and girls who want to get into the movies not as actors and actresses alone but as directors writers and in a score of other ways in the course of our work mr emerson's and mine we have been asked repeatedly to speak before colleges clubs high schools and public gatherings we always do our utmost to accommodate 
and only recently we spoke at a college up in new england now our experience repeats itself in each case those in the audience are filled to the brim with questions they want answered we have had thousands of such questions hurled at us and i can say that these thousands are only as many variations of but twenty basic questions yes i am quite safe in saying that i could prepare a list of twenty questions and cover all the thousands of queries that have been asked us strange to say the question most asked is should the manuscript be typewritten the second is is it necessary that it be written in scenario form that is to say in technical scene-by-scene -scene style and the third one is how much will i get for it if it is accepted we are speaking of radio now and the answers to those questions are unimportant but to satisfy any curious readers i will say that the answer to the first is yes to the second no and the third depends on how badly it is wanted by the company and what it is worth to them because we know what our audience want we always start off such a meeting by asking for questions to be written on a piece of paper these are collected and the audience is thoroughly satisfied in merely getting answers it is the old story of the inborn curiosity of people radio could be used to satisfy this craving each broadcasting station could advertise that on such and such a day doug fairbanks or mary pickford or william s hart will answer any questions on a given subject that have been sent to the station by a certain time in other words the radio public to send questions the speaker to answer not only on the movies but on other subjects as well one week the station could have an expert on short story writing answer questions the next on salesmanship and so on indefinitely the speaker would say something like this jim brown wants to know etc 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 i would say that etc 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 miss lewes added that she could see no way radio could be made to serve the movies in the making or exhibiting but that the future development of radio alone could decide that miss lewes has been associated with the movies for more than ten years despite her youth she started to write when fifteen years old and as she says was fortunate enough to have her first story accepted this encouraged her and despite the fact that many rejections followed it made her stick to the thing she liked her first picture was a very short film called her new york hat and old-time movie fans will still remember it mary pickford acted in it and so did other stars of today the scenario writer was born and educated in california and listen she went on the stage at the mature age of four years she was carried on her father was a theatrical manager and a newspaper man and her entire life has been woven about the stage and the movies she quit acting to write for the pictures and when she really got under way in the profession she had an average of three scenarios accepted each month her first regular job was with d w griffith on the pacific coast griffith sent for her after she had been selling him plots for two years the next time you see a picture constance talmage look for the name of anita Luz, for most of the constance talmage films are written by the dainty writer and her husband End of question and answer department for the broadcasting program an interview with anita Luz by paul s gaultier no tax on books by united states senator charles sumner 1864 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks in the Senate The Senator from New York, Mr. Morgan, has proposed the exemption of a class of hospitals. I am in favor of his proposition. It is not now, however, under discussion. 
in similar spirit i move to strike out on the one hundred and thirty fifth page lines two hundred and twelve two hundred and thirteen and two hundred and fourteen as follows on all printed books magazines pamphlets reviews and all other similar printed publications except newspapers a duty of five per cent ad valorem i make one remark on this tax we do not tax wheat or corn because they are the staff of life in my judgment a tax on books is less defensible than a tax on wheat or on corn i believe books are the staff of life and i believe that our country would do itself honour if at this moment when imposing a heavy tax upon all things it deliberately exempted books the tax proposed is applicable to all books books for family reading for the library and also for the school all that we can get from the tax will be very small indeed it will not add sensibly to the treasury but it will impose a burden upon knowledge i hope therefore that the senate will strike the words out the motion was rejected at the next stage of the bill mr sumner renewed his motion to strike out the tax on books and then said mr president i am sorry to occupy the attention of the senate even for a moment especially at this late stage of a protracted debate but i feel that the question which i have presented is not adequately appreciated i venture to say that in point of principle few questions of equal importance have arisen on this bill the tax on books is peculiar and so far as i know without precedent in other countries in england paper has been taxed but books not here paper is to be taxed and books also for instance there is to be a tax of three per cent on paper and then five per cent additional on books making a sum total of eight per cent on books the tax of three per cent on paper seems contrary to sound policy but the additional tax of five per cent on books is more indefensible still i have already likened it to a tax on wheat or flour or bread which you do not think of imposing more than either of these is a book the staff of life it may be likened also to a tax on the light of day like the english window tax which you do not think of imposing better shut out the light of day than the light of books the book in some cases may be a luxury but in most cases it is a necessary while always the handmaid of civilization it is for all ages and all conditions for young and old for rich and poor for the family circle as well as the library but it is especially for the school in all these places you will enter and demand eight per cent on every book every book if it had a voice would repel the demand why not be instructed by the example of england when taxing everything taxable read the extensive list of articles taxed at the period of most searching and widespread taxation and you do not find books read that marvellous enumeration made by the genius of sidney smith and you do not find books Quote, taxes upon every article which enters into the mouth or covers the back or is placed under the foot taxes upon everything which it is pleasant to see hear feel smell or taste taxes upon warmth light and locomotion taxes on everything on earth and the waters under the earth on everything that comes from abroad or is grown at home taxes on the raw material taxes on every fresh value that is added to it by the industry of man taxes on the sauce which pampers man's appetite and the drug that restores him to health on the ermine which decorates the judge and the rope which hangs the criminal on the poor man's salt and the rich man's spice on the brass nails of the coffin and the ribbons of the bride at bed or board couchon or levant we must pay the schoolboy whips his taxed top the beardless youth manages his taxed horse with a taxed bridle on a taxed road and the dying englishman pouring his medicine which has paid seven per cent into a spoon that has paid fifteen per cent flings himself back upon his chintz bed which has paid twenty-two per cent 
and expires in the arms of an apothecary who has paid a license of a hundred pounds for the privilege of putting him to death his whole property is then immediately taxed from two to ten per cent besides the probate large fees are demanded for burying him in the chancel his virtues are handed down to posterity on taxed marble and he is then gathered to his fathers to be taxed no more End quote. a passage so exquisite in wit and language is seasonable here especially when considering what shall be taxed but i ask you to bear in mind that the english tax-gatherer never laid his hand on a book everything else he might touch a book never and yet in our country it is proposed to tax books this is the land of public schools where you boast that education like justice is free to all at the common cost but a tax on books is in direct conflict with this beautiful principle every argument for free schools pleads also for free books at least for freedom from taxation it will be a curious inconsistency to rear the schoolhouse often costly where every child is welcomed without charge and then compel him to pay a tax of eight per cent on every book he carries in his satchel there is one term which fitly characterizes this tax it is a term adopted abroad but more justly applicable to a tax on books than to any other tax i mean a tax on knowledge such is the tax now proposed and this tax which cannot be named without awakening just condemnation you are asked to make an american institution after long struggle in england the various taxes on knowledge are abandoned i hope that our country representative and defender of liberal ideas will not commence a system which modern civilization has disowned i ask for the yeas and nays the motion was lost yeas eight nays nineteen end of no tax on books by charles sumner read by david wales on gardening by robert f moey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org if i have any claim at all to speak on this subject it is derived less from experience than from observation what little practical knowledge of gardening i possess was acquired in early youth under compulsion and even then it was restricted to the weeding of paths and the watering of plants neither of these operations useful as they both undoubtedly are can be said to foster a taste for the art or an acquaintance with the science of gardening they are mechanical and unattractive anybody can do them and nobody would do them if he could help it this is especially true of weeding to be set to weed a number of grass-grown gravel paths on a saturday afternoon in july has been the unhappy fate of many a schoolboy from time immemorial and i believe there are few instances on record in which the schoolboy has not either openly or secretly rebelled many causes urge him to do so the sun dries up the marrow in his bones the wind is so still as to induce the belief that it will never blow again his back aches his knees are cramped his eyes are dazzled by the yellow glare of the gravel nor is this all the minute green pests are so wonderfully productive that they seem to increase and multiply before his eyes and paradox as it may appear the more he pulls up the more there are left he is quick to notice this discouraging circumstance and the discovery too often leads him to the adoption of certain devices not over honest for instance he will gather from the surface of the path quantities of loose gravel which he will dispose in so judicious a manner as to conceal many growing weeds from the stern eye of the inspecting parent or he will content himself with nipping off the heads of the weeds 
while he leaves their roots intact in the ground there to bring forth and bud anew before many days by such unsatisfactory methods he strives after economy of labour and indeed he does accomplish one weeding with almost startling celerity but then how short is the period that intervenes before he must undertake another it will be seen that weeding is the parent of sin as well as of sorrow and it is therefore except on the score of absolute necessity entirely to be deprecated the watering of plants is an innocent recreation compared to it generally speaking plants are watered in the cool of the morning or evening and the operator is not compelled to suffer intolerable heat in addition to performing distasteful toil even watering however has many drawbacks carrying a heavy can to and fro and holding it a long time suspended over the beds is apt to tire the arm then the watering can may leak as a rule it does before long the young aquarius finds one leg of his trousers growing soppy and one foot getting clammy and cold ought we to be surprised if in proportion as his temperature falls his temper rises besides he would much rather be playing marbles i have been betrayed into too long a digression upon the sorrows of the youthful apprentice to gardening amateur he cannot with propriety be called for it is years before he can even look at a garden without a pang of remembered pain such at least was the case with me i vowed that if i ever came to own a plot of ground i would turn it into a shrubbery and let it run wild nature i argued is better than art and at all events an art achieved at the expense of so much misery is not worth practising but from the time when i outgrew this morbid feeling i have always admired and envied all gardeners from adam downward and more especially adam for there were no weeds in the garden of eden yet even since the fall the gardener himself has been free from the ignoble toil of weeding which is always left to boys and is perhaps a judgment upon them for their original sin the gardener is busied in grander operations he delves he hoes he plants he sows and above all he plans his is no mere handicraft he works with his hands it is true but he is also for ever working with his head arrangement and order do not cease to shape themselves within his busy brain if you told him so the chances are ten to one that he would scratch his head and deny it not knowing what you meant it is true nevertheless and members of the craft have not been wanting who were fully alive to its truth and importance there still flourishes somewhere in the west of england an old man with curved legs and sandy whiskers who is accustomed to work by the day in the gardens of those who can afford to hire him sometimes he will be employed by the week together in one garden on one such occasion his temporary master observed that joe never came to his work until the morning was well advanced so on the third or fourth day he waited in the garden and by and by joe came sauntering leisurely in good morning joe manin zur nice manin smanin it seems to me you always come rather late to work joe yes sir was the ready answer but i'd a lie in bed and plan for e in this way he considered that he was fulfilling his engagement and so perhaps he was yet it must be admitted that it requires faith more than a grain of mustard seed to enable one to pay cheerfully for such invisible service the invisible service of a hireling being always more or less doubtful but with your true gardener who is not paid by the day but whose labour pays him after many days there can be no question of the planning he is a skilled general and disposes his forces in the best methods at his command 
methods gathered from the traditions of his predecessors the experience of himself and his contemporaries and his own anxious thought he has nothing to gain by pretending to plan he has everything to lose by not planning nor is his interest in his work of a merely utilitarian kind he is in a certain sense an artist and like other artists he takes pride and pleasure in his work for its own sake he has the same delight in good workmanship the same or a similar love of broad conception like the painter he plans with his brain and executes with his hand his work like the painter's is his own bringing him pleasure as well as profit he looks round his garden and says to himself all this is mine the labour is mine and the fruit of it is mine with what honest self gratulation he gazes on the trimly pruned trees on the well-ordered beds how great is his satisfaction in a fine potato crop or a splendid yield of parsnips he is bound to acknowledge that sun and rain have done their part in producing the good results but then on the other hand sun and rain have done just as much for williams's garden and his potatoes are not worth the trouble of digging of course it is not to be supposed that a gardener's lot is one of uninterrupted pleasure or undisturbed peace lord tennyson has told us that the very source and fount of day is dashed with wandering isles of night and so even a gardener's life has its annoyances and difficulties his crops will occasionally fail in spite of wise planning and careful labour the slugs will eat his strawberries the green fly will make havoc among his rose trees the wire worm and the frost are his sworn foes he has many things against him but then what a glorious constitution he has with which to withstand and overcome them he has no dyspepsia to darken his spirit or enfeeble his will all day he breathes pure air and smells fresh healthy scents all night he sleeps the sleep of the just unbroken by evil dreams he is early to bed and early to rise and he is consequently healthy wealthy and wise his troubles are not engendered within but come to him from without there are no traitors in his camp to fear but only open foes in the field to face and fight strong in himself he need not fear what they can do to him it is an ideal life the gardener's and a noble profession you cannot call it a trade the trading element only comes in when he parts with his produce to the greengrocer who keeps a fusty little shop in a back street the gardener is no more of a tradesman than the artist the one sells his pictures to a dealer who makes his living by selling them again at a higher price the other does the same with his potatoes the picture dealer and the greengrocer are tradesmen but the gardener and the artist are professional men thus far i have looked at gardening only in the light of a profession but for the amateur there is no finer hobby antiquarian research is not to be compared with it scientific dabbling is barren beside it and if politics be laid in the balance they are altogether lighter than vanity who has not known and envied the country clergyman with a passion for gardening it is such a peaceful passion not a fierce and intermittent flame but a steady glow imparting light and warmth to life the clergyman's pleasure in his garden is of course unalloyed by the pecuniary cares which must beset the professional gardener while his pride in it is infinitely greater than the others can possibly be is he not pursuing the art for the pure love of it without hope or desire of gain he can sit down to dinner with his guest and when the latter praises the cauliflower or avers that he never tasted finer green peas in his life he can beam with satisfaction and say i grew them he can tell little anecdotes concerning the potatoes on the table he is the biographer of the carrots and when 
after dinner on a fine evening in early autumn he takes his guest out and shows him over the garden he has no lack of topics for conversation he could talk for a week if the guest should happen also to be a country clergyman an amateur gardener the dialogue is something wonderful to hear they grow more excited over the merits of a favourite plum tree than two cabinet ministers over a dissolution the host exhausts his powers of eloquence in dilating upon the colour size and flavour of his plums the guest is equally fervid in eulogising a tree of his own at home these are very fine he says condescendingly but come over to my place if you want to taste plums and so the two honest old souls go on each praising the other's produce but maintaining the superiority of his own as iron sharpeneth iron so doth a man's fruit make sweeter that of his friend in addition to these dialogical delights the clergyman can take prizes at the local horticultural shows and so gratify the feeling of ambition that lurks in the breast of every man even of the country clergyman best of all his rooms are lighted up and sweetened with flowers whose sweetness and light are doubled by the knowledge that they are to a certain extent his own creations perhaps even more so than his sermons are he is a blessing to others and to himself there is not a wedding or a festival a mourning or a funeral for which his flowers are not in request the festival he enriches with glowing colour the morning he beautifies with pure and saintly white for himself he gathers joy and health and heart's ease in his garden by his labour there he lengthens his life and makes it more worth living and when at length his hand forgets to pluck the flowers that have carried hope and inspiration into many a weary sick-room their place is taken in grateful hearts by flowers of remembrance surely not less fragrant end of on gardening by robert f murray on a new kind of rays by wilhelm conrad röntgen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. On a New Kind of Rays by Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen from Science, Volume 3, Number 59, February 14, 1896. From the Translation in Nature by Arthur Stanton from the Sitzungsberichte der Würzburger Physikalischen Medischen Gesellschaft, 1895. 1. A discharge from a large induction coil is passed through a Hittorf's vacuum tube or through a well exhausted Crookes or Leonard's tube. The tube is surrounded by a fairly close fitting shield of black paper. It is then possible to see, in a completely darkened room, that paper covered on one side with barium platinocyanide lights up with brilliant fluorescence when brought into the neighborhood of the tube whether the painted side or the other be turned towards the tube the fluorescence is still visible at two meters distance it is easy to show that the origin of the fluorescence lies within the vacuum tube two it is seen, therefore, that some agent is capable of penetrating black cardboard which is quite opaque to ultraviolet light, sunlight or arc light. It is therefore of interest to investigate how far other bodies can be penetrated by the same agent. It is readily shown that all bodies possess this same transparency, but in very varying degrees. For example, paper is very transparent. The fluorescent screen will light up when placed behind a book of a thousand pages. Printer's ink offers no marked resistance. 
Similarly, the fluorescence shows behind two packs of cards. A single card does not visibly diminish the brilliancy of the light. So, again, a single thickness of tin foil hardly casts a shadow on the screen. Several have to be superposed to produce a marked effect. Thick blocks of wood are still transparent. Boards of pine two or three centimeters thick absorb only very little. A piece of sheet aluminium fifteen millimeters thick still showed the X-rays, as I will call the rays for the sake of brevity, to pass, but greatly reduced the fluorescence. Glass plates of similar thickness behave similarly. Lead glass is, however, much more opaque than glass free from lead. Ebonite several centimeters thick is transparent. If the hand be held before the fluorescent screen, the shadow shows the bones darkly, with only faint outlines of the surrounding tissues. Water and several other fluids are very transparent. Hydrogen is not markedly more permeable than air. Plates of copper, silver, lead, gold and platinum also allow the ray to pass, but only when the metal is thin. Platinum, 0.2 mm thick, allows some rays to pass. Silver and copper are more transparent. Lead, 1.5 mm thick, is practically opaque. If a square rod of wood 20 mm in the side be painted on one face with white lead, it casts little shadow when it is so turned that the painted face is parallel to the X-rays, but a strong shadow if the rays have to pass through the painted side. The salts of the metal, either solid or in solution, behave generally as the metals themselves. 3. The preceding experiments lead to the conclusion that the density of the bodies is the property whose variation mainly affects their permeability. At least no other property seems so marked in this connection. But that the density alone does not determine the transparency is shown by an experiment wherein plates of similar thickness of Iceland spar, glass, aluminium and quartz were employed as screens. Then the Iceland spar showed itself much less transparent than the other bodies, though of approximately the same density. I have not remarked any strong fluorescence of Iceland spar compared with glass. See below, number 4. 4. Increasing thickness increases the hindrance offered to the rays by all bodies. A picture has been impressed on a photographic plate of a number of superposed layers of tin foil, like steps, presenting thus a regularly increasing thickness. This is to be submitted to photometric processes when a suitable instrument is available. 5. Pieces of platinum, lead, zinc and aluminium foil were so arranged as to produce the same weakening of the effect. The annexed table shows the relative thickness and density of the equivalent sheets of metal. Platinum 0 0.018 mm thick Relative thickness 1 Density 21.5 Lead 0 0.050 mm thick Relative thickness 3 Density 11.3 Zinc 0 0.100 mm thick Relative thickness 6. Density 7.1. Aluminium 3.500 mm thick. Relative thickness 200. Density 2.6. From these values, it is clear that in no case can we obtain the transparency of a body from the product of its density and thickness. The transparency increases much more rapidly than the product decreases. 6. The fluorescence of barium platinocyanide is not the only noticeable action of the X-rays. 
It is to be observed that other bodies exhibit fluorescence, that is, calcium sulphide, uranium glass, Iceland spar, rock salt, etc. Of special interest in this connection is the fact that photographic dry plates are sensitive to the X-rays. It is thus possible to exhibit the phenomena so as to exclude the danger of error. I have thus confirmed many observations originally made by eye observation with the fluorescent screen. Here the power of the X-rays to pass through wood or cardboard becomes useful. The photographic plate can be exposed to the action without removal of the shutter of the dark slide or other protecting case, so that the experiment need not be conducted in darkness. Manifestly, unexposed plates must not be left in their box near the vacuum tube. It seems now questionable whether the impression on the plate is a direct effect of the X-rays or a secondary result induced by the fluorescence of the material of the plate. Films can receive the impression as well as ordinarily dry plates. I have not been able to show experimentally that the X-rays give rise to any calorific effects. These, however, may be assumed, for the phenomena of fluorescence show that the X-rays are capable of transformation. It is also certain that all the X-rays falling on a body do not leave it as such. The retina of the eye is quite insensitive to these rays. The eye placed close to the apparatus sees nothing. It is clear from the experiments that this is not due to want of permeability on the part of the structures of the eye. 7. After my experiments on the transparency of increasing thicknesses of different media, I proceeded to investigate whether the X-rays could be deflected by a prism. Investigations with water and carbon bisulfide in mica prisms of 30 degrees showed no deviations either on the photographic or on the fluorescent plate. For comparison, light rays were allowed to fall on the prism as the apparatus was set up for the experiment. They were deviated 10 mm and 20 mm respectively in the case of the two prisms. With prisms of ebonite and aluminium, I have obtained images on the photographic plate which point to a possible deviation. It is, however, uncertain, and at most would point to a refractive index 1.05. No deviation can be observed by means of the fluorescent screen. Investigations with the heavier metals have not as yet led to any result, because of their small transparency and the consequent enfeebling of the transmitted rays. On account of the importance of the question, it is desirable to try in other ways whether the X-rays are susceptible of refraction. Finely powdered bodies allow in thick layers but little of the incident light to pass through, in consequence of refraction and reflection. In the case of the X-rays, however, such layers of powder are for equal masses of substance equally transparent with the coherent solid itself. Hence, we cannot conclude any regular reflection or refraction of the X-rays. The research was conducted by the aid of finely powdered rock salt, fine electrolytic silver powder and zinc dust, already many times employed in chemical work. In all these cases, the result, whether by the fluorescent screen or the photographic method, indicated no difference in transparency between the powder and the coherent solid. It is, hence, obvious that lenses cannot be looked upon as capable of concentrating the X-rays. In effect, both an ebonite and a glass lens of large size prove to be without action. The shadow photograph of a round rod is darker in the middle than at the edge. The image of a cylinder filled with a body more transparent than its walls exhibits the middle brighter than the edge. 8. 
the preceding experiments and others which I pass over, point to the rays being incapable of regular reflection. It is, however, well to detail an observation which at first sight seemed to lead to an opposite conclusion. I exposed a plate, protected by a black paper sheath, to the X-rays, so that the glass side lay next to the vacuum tube. The sensitive film was partly covered with star-shaped pieces of platinum, lead, zinc, and aluminium. On the developed negative, the star-shaped impression showed dark under platinum, lead, and, more markedly, under zinc, the aluminium gave no image. It seems, therefore, that these three metals can reflect the X-rays. As, however, another explanation is possible, I repeated the experiment with this only difference that a film of thin aluminium foil was interposed between the sensitive film and the metal stars. Such an aluminium plate is opaque to ultraviolet rays, but transparent to X-rays. In the result, the images appeared as before, this pointing still to the existence of reflection at metal surfaces. If one considers this observation in connection with others, namely on the transparency of powders, and on the state of the surface not being effective in altering the passage of the X-rays through a body, it leads to the probable conclusion that regular reflection does not exist, but that bodies behave to the X-rays as turbid media to light. Since I have obtained no evidence of refraction at the surface of different media, it seems probable that the X-rays move with the same velocity in all bodies, and in a medium which penetrates everything, and in which the molecules of bodies are embedded. The molecules obstruct the X-rays the more effectively as the density of the body concerned is greater. 9. It seemed possible that the geometrical arrangement of the molecules might affect the action of a body upon the X-rays, so that, for example, Iceland spar might exhibit different phenomena according to the relation of the surface of the plate to the axis of the crystal. Experiments with quartz and Iceland spar on this point led to a negative result. 10. It is known that Lenard, in his investigations on cathode rays, has shown that they belong to the ether and can pass through all bodies. Concerning the X-rays, the same may be said. In his latest work, Lenard has investigated the absorption coefficients of various bodies for the cathode rays, including air at atmospheric pressure, which gives 4.10, 3.40, 3.10, 4.10, 3.40, 3.10, 3.40, 3.10, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40, 3.40
which differ by their power of exciting phosphorescence, their susceptibility of absorption, and their deviation by the magnet. But a notable deviation has been observed in all cases which have yet been investigated, and I think that such deviation affords a characteristic not to be set aside lightly. 12. As the result of many researches, it appears that the place of most brilliant phosphorescence of the walls of the discharge tube is the chief seat whence the X-rays originate and spread in all directions. That is, the X-rays proceed from the front where cathode rays strike the glass. If one deviates the cathode rays within the tube by means of a magnet, it is seen that the X-rays proceed from a new point, that is, again from the end of the cathode rays. Also for this reason the X-rays which are not deflected by a magnet cannot be regarded as cathode rays which have passed through the glass, for that passage cannot, according to Lenard, be the cause of the different deflection of the X-rays. Hence I concluded that the rays are not identical with the cathode rays, but are produced from the cathode rays at the glass surface of the tube. 13. The rays are generated not only in glass. I have obtained them in an apparatus closed by an aluminium plate two millimeters thick. I propose later to investigate the behavior of other substances. 14. The justification of the term rays applied to the phenomena lies partly in the regular shadow pictures produced by the interposition of a more or less permeable body between the source and a photographic plate or fluorescent screen. I have observed and photographed many such shadow pictures. Thus I have an outline of part of a door covered with lead paint, the image was produced by placing the discharge tube on one side of the door and the sensitive plate on the other. I have also a shadow of the bones of the hand, figure 1, of a wire wound upon a bobbin, of a set of ways in a box of a compass card and needle completely enclosed in a metal case, of a piece of metal where the x-rays show the want of homogeneity and of other things. For the rectilinear propagation of the rays, I have a pinhole photograph of the discharge apparatus covered with black paper. It is faint, but unmistakable. 15. I have sought for interference effects of the X-rays, but possibly, in consequence of their small intensity, without result. 16. Researches to investigate whether electrostatic forces act on the X-rays are begun, but not yet concluded. 17. If one asks what then are these X-rays, since they are not cathode rays, one might suppose, from their power of exciting fluorescence and chemical action, them to be due to ultraviolet light. In opposition to this view, a weighty set of considerations presents itself. If X-rays be indeed ultraviolet light, then that light must possess the following properties. A. It is not refracted in passing from air into water, carbon bisulfide, aluminium, rock salt, glass or zinc. B. It is incapable of regular reflection at the surfaces of the above bodies. C. It cannot be polarized by any ordinary polarizing media. D. The absorption by various bodies must depend chiefly on their density. That is to say, these ultraviolet rays must behave quite differently from the visible, infrared and hitherto known ultraviolet rays. These things appear so unlikely that I have sought for another hypothesis. A kind of relationship between the new rays and light rays appears to exist, 
at least the formation of shadows fluorescence and the production of chemical action point in this direction now it has been known for a long time that besides the transverse vibrations which account for the phenomena of light it is possible that longitudinal vibrations should exist in the ether and according to the view of some physicists must exist it is granted that their existence has not yet been made clear and their properties are not experimentally demonstrated should not the new rays be ascribed to longitudinal waves in the ether i must confess that i have in the course of this research made myself more and more familiar with this thought and venture to put the opinion forward while i am quite conscious that the hypothesis advanced still requires a more solid foundation wilhelm conrad röntgen end of on a new kind of rays by wilhelm conrad röntgen read by abai oscar wilde an idler's impression by edgar saltus this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Years ago, in a Paris club, one man said to another, Well, what's up? The other shook a paper. There's only one genius in England, and they've put him in jail. One may wonder, though, whether it were their doing, or even Wilde's, that put him there. One may wonder whether it were not the high fates who so gratified him in order that, from his purgatory, he might rise to a life more evolved. But that view is perhaps obvious. Wilde himself, who was the least mystic of men, accepted it. In the De Profundis, after weighing his disasters, he said, Of these things I am not yet worthy. The genuflection has been called a pose. It may have been. Even so, it is perhaps better to kneel, though it be in the gallery, than to stoop at nothing, and Wilde, who had stood very high, bent very low. He saw that there is one thing greater than greatness, and that is humility. Yet though he saw it, it is presumable that he forgot it. It is presumable that the grace which was his in prison departed in Paris. On the other hand, it may not have. There are no human scales for any soul. It was at Delmonico's, shortly after he told our local customs that he had nothing to declare but genius, that I first met him. He was dressed like a mountebank. Without, at the entrance, a crowd had collected. In the restaurant, people stood up and stared. Wilde was beautifully unmoved. He was talking, at first, about nothing whatever, which is always an interesting topic, then about Vera, a play of his for which a local manager had offered him an advance, $5,000, I think, mere starvation wages, as he put it, and he went on to say that the manager wanted him to make certain changes in it. He paused and added, but who am I to tamper with a masterpiece? A jest which afterward he was too generous to hoard. Later in London I saw him again. In appearance and mode of life he had become entirely conventional, the long hair, the knee breeches, the lilies, the velvet, all the mountebank trappings had gone. He was married, he was a father, and in his house in Tite Street he seemed a bit bourgeois. Of that he may have been conscious. I remember one of his children running and calling at him, My good papa! And I remember Wilde patting the boy and saying, Don't call me that, it sounds so respectable. In Tite Street I had the privilege of meeting Mrs. Oscar, who asked me to write something in an album. I have always hated albuminous poetry, and as I turned the pages in search of possible inspiration, I happened on this. From a poet to a poem, Robert Browning. Poets exaggerate, and why should they not? They have been found, too, with their hands in other people's paragraphs. Wilde helped himself to that line, which he put in a sonnet to this lady, who had blue eyes, fair hair, chapped lips, and a look of constant bewilderment. As for that, Oscar was sufficiently bewildering. He talked infinitely better than he wrote, and on no topic, no matter what, could he talk as other mortals must. 
Once only I heard of him uttering a platitude, and from anyone else that platitude would have been a paradox. He exuded wit and waded in it with a serenity that was disconcerting. It was on this abnormal serenity and on his equally abnormal brilliance that he relied to defeat the prosecution. I have all the criminal classes with me, he announced, and that was his one platitude, a banality that contrived to be tragic. Then headlong down the stair of life he fell. Hell he had long since summarised as the union of souls without bodies to bodies without souls. There are worse definitions than this which, years later, I recalled when, through a curious forethought of fate, he was taken, en route to the cemetery, through the Porte de l'Enfer. But in Tite Street, at this time, and in Regent Street, where he occasionally dined, he was gentle, wholesome, and joyous, a man who paid compliments because, as he put it, he could pay nothing else. He had been caricatured, the caricatures had ceased. People had turned to look, they turned no longer. He was forgiven and, what is worse, forgotten. Yet that tiger, his destiny, was but sharpening its claws. At an inn where Gautier dined, the epigrams were so demoralising that a waiter became insane. Similarly, in the Regent Street restaurant, it was reported, perhaps falsely, that a waiter had also lost his reason. But Wilde, though a three-decanter man, always preserved his own. He preserved, too, his courtesy, which was invariable. The most venomous thing he ever said of anyone was that he was a tedious person, and the only time he ever rebuked anybody was at the conclusion of one of those after-dinner stories which some host or other interrupted by rising and saying, "'Shall we continue the conversation in the drawing-room?' "'But I am in error. That was not his only rebuke. On one occasion I drove with him to Tite Street. An hour previous he had executed a variation on the sujet et roi. If I were a king, he had sung, I would sit in a great hall and paint on green ivory, and when my ministers came and told me that the people were starving, I would continue to paint on green ivory and say, let them starve. The aria was rendered in the rooms of Francis Hope, a young man who later married and divorced May Yohi, but who at the time showed an absurd interest in stocks. Someone else entered and Hope asked what was new in the city. "'Money is very tight,' came the reply. "'Ah, yes,' Wilde cut in, "'and of a tightness that has been felt even in Tight Street. "'Believe me, I passed the forenoon at the British Museum "'looking at a gold piece in a case. "'Afterward we drove to Chelsea. "'It was a vile night, bleak and bitter. "'On alighting, a man came up to me. "'He wore a short jacket which he opened. "'From neck to waist he was bare. "'I gave him a shilling,' Then came the rebuke. With entire simplicity, Wilde took off his overcoat and put it about the man. But the simplicity seemed to me too Hugo-esque, and I said, Why didn't you ask him into dinner? Wilde gestured, Dinner is not a feast, it is a ceremony. Subsequently, that ceremony must have been contemplated, for Mrs. Wilde was kind enough to invite me. The invitation reached me some time in advance, and I took it, of course, that there would be other guests. But on the appointed evening, or what I thought was the appointed evening when I reached this house, on which Oscar objected to paying taxes because, as he told the astonished assessors, he was so seldom at home, when I reached it, it seemed to me that I must be the only guest. Then, presently, in the dreary drawing room, Oscar appeared. This is delightful of you, he told me. I have been late for dinner a half hour. Again, a whole hour. You are late an entire week. That is what I call originality. I put a bold face on it. Come to my shop, I said, and have dinner with me. Though, I added, I don't know what I can give you. Oh, anything, Wilde replied. Anything, no matter what. I have the simplest tastes. I am always satisfied with the best. He was not boasting. One evening he dined on his Sphinx. Subsequently, I supped with him on Salome. That was in the Regent Street restaurant where, apropos of nothing, or rather with what to me at the time was curious irrelevance, Oscar was tossing off glass after glass of liquor, spoke of Femme, 
a goddess rare even in mythology who after appearing twice in homer flashed through a verse of hesiod and vanished behind a page of herodotus in telling of her suddenly his eyes lifted his mouth contracted a spasm of pain or was it dread had gripped him a moment only his face relaxed it had gone i have since wondered could he have evoked the goddess then for Feme typified what modern occultism terms the impact, the premonition that surges and warns. It was Wilde's fate to die three times, to die in the dock, to die in prison, to die all along the boulevards of Paris. Often since I have wondered, could the goddess then have been lifting, however slightly, some fringe of the crimson curtain, behind which, in all its horror, his destiny crouched? If so, he braved it. I had looked away. I looked again. Before me was a fat pauper, florid and overdressed, who, in the voice of an immortal, was reading the fantasies of the damned. In his hand was a manuscript, and we were supping on Salome. As the banquet proceeded, I experienced that sense of sacred terror which his friends, the Greeks, knew so well. For this thing could have been conceived only by genius wedded to insanity, and at the end when the tetrarch rising and bundling his robes about him cries kill that woman the mysterious divinity whom the poet may have evoked deigned perhaps to visit me for as i applauded i shuddered and told him that i had indifferently he nodded and assimilating hugo with superb unconcern threw out it is only the shudder that counts that was long before the crash after it, Mrs. Wilde said that he was mad, and had been for three years, quite mad, as the poor woman expressed it. It may be that she was right. St. George, I believe, fought a dragon with a spear. Whether or not he killed the brute, I have forgotten. But Wilde fought poverty, which is perhaps more brutal, with a pen. The fight, if indolent, was protracted. Then, abruptly, his inkstand became a Vesuvius of gold, london that had laughed at him laughed with him and laughed colossally a penny a liner was famous the international hurdle race of the stage had been won in a canter and won by a hack a sub-editor was top of the heap the ascent was perhaps too rapid the spiderous fates that sit and spin are jealous of sudden success it may be that mrs wilde was right in any event, for some time before the crash he saw few of his former friends. After his release, few of his former friends saw him. But personally, if I may refer to myself, I am not near-sighted. I saw him in Paris, saw too, and to my regret, that he looked like a drunken coachman, and told him how greatly I admired the ballad, that poem which tells of his life, or rather of his death, in jail half covering his mouth with his hand he laughed and said it does not seem to me sufficiently vecu before the enormity of that i fell back but at once he became more human he complained that even the opiate of work was denied him since no one would handle his wares the athenians who lived surrounded by statues learned from them the value of silence the mystery that it lends to beauty in particular the dignity that it gives to grief in their tragedies, any victim of destiny is as though stricken dumb. Wilde knew that. He knew everything, in addition to being a thorough Hellenist. Nonetheless, he told of his fate. It was human, therefore terrible, but it was not the tragic muse. It was merely a tragedy of letters. Letters, yes, but lower case. Wilde was a third-rate poet who occasionally rose to the second class, but not once to the first. Prose is more difficult than verse, and in it he is rather sloppy. In spite of which, or perhaps precisely on that account, he called himself Lord of Language. Well, why not if he wanted to? Besides, in his talk he was Lord and more, Sultan, Pontifex Maximus. Hook, Gerald, Smith, Sheridan, rolled into one, could not have been as brilliant. In talk he blinded, and it is the subsiding wonder of it that his plays contain. In the old maps, on the vague places, early geographers used to put Hic sunt leones, here are lions. On any catalogue of Wilde's plays, there should be written Here lions might have been. 
for assuming his madness one must also admit his genius and the uninterrupted conjunction of the two might have produced brilliancies such as few bookshelves display therein is the tragedy of letters renan said that morality is the supreme illusion the diagnosis may or may not be exact yet it is on illusions that we all subsist we live on lies by day and dreams at night from the standpoint of the higher mathematics morality may be an illusion but it is very sustaining formerly it was also inspirational in post-pagan days it created a new conception of beauty apart from that it has nothing whatever to do with the arts except the art of never displeasing which in itself is the whole secret of mediocrity oscar wilde lacked that art and i can think of no better epitaph for him End of Oscar Wilde, An Idler's Impression by Edgar Saltus The Philosophy of Religion by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel Excerpt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the philosophy of religion by georg wilhelm friedrich hegel excerpt hegel's philosophy of religion was published the year following the philosopher's death at berlin in eighteen thirty two and the rugged shape and uneven construction of some of it may fairly be attributed to the fact that as it stands it is largely an editorial compilation such faults however as dr edward caird has remarked if they take from the lectures as expressions of their author's mind and from their value as scientific treatises have some compensating advantages if we regard them as a means of education in philosophy for in this point of view their very artlessness gives them something of the same stimulating suggestive power which is attained by the consummate art of the platonic dialogues the importance of the work is evidenced by the influence it has exercised over the mind of a later generation and many readers to whom hegel is little more than a name will certainly find here the sources of much that has become familiar as an essential part of the religious atmosphere of a later day and of the apologies of modern speculative theology one the relation of philosophy to religion the object of religion is the same as that of philosophy it is the external verity itself in its objective existence it is god nothing but god and the unfolding of god philosophy is not the wisdom of the world but the knowledge of things which are not of this world it is not the knowledge of external mass of empirical life and existence but of the eternal of the nature of god and of all which flows from his nature for this nature ought to manifest and develop itself consequently philosophy and unfolding religion merely unfolds itself and in unfolding itself it unfolds religion in so far as philosophy is occupied with the eternal truth the truth which is in and for itself in so far as it is occupied with this as thinking spirit rather than in an arbitrary fashion and in view of a particular interest philosophy has the same sphere of activity as has religion and if the religious consciousness aspires to abolish all that is peculiar to itself and to be absorbed in its object the philosophic spirit likewise plunges with the same energy into its object and renounces all particularity religion and philosophy are thus at one in having one and the same object philosophy in fact also is the adoration of god it is religion for seeing that god is its object it involves the same renunciation of every opinion and every thought that is arbitrary and subjective philosophy is in consequence identical with religion only it is religion in a peculiar manner and this it is which distinguishes it from religion commonly so called 
so philosophy and religion are both religion and that which distinguishes one from the other is no more than the characteristic mode in which respectively they consider their object god here is the difficulty of understanding how philosophy can make but one with religion a difficulty which has even been mistaken for impossibility thence also arises the fears which philosophy inspires in theology and the hostile attitudes which they assume towards each other what brings about this attitude is on the side of theology that for her philosophy does nothing but corrupt pull down and profane the content of religion and that she understands god in a totally different manner from that after which religion understands him it is the same opposition which long ago among the greeks caused a free and democratic people like the athenians to burn books and to condemn socrates in our own day however this opposition is considered a thing which is natural to admit more natural indeed than the other opinion concerning the unity of religion and philosophy diverse religions offer us it is true only too often the most bizarre and monstrous representations of the divine essence but we must not confine ourselves to a superficial consideration and consequent rejection of these representations and the religious practices which follow upon them as being engendered by superstition by air or by imposture or even by a simple piety and so neglect their essential value there is a need to discover in these representations and in these practices their relation with truth two god the universal for us who have religion god is a familiar being a substantial truth existing in our subjective consciousness but scientifically considered god is a general and abstract term the philosophy of religion it is which develops and grasps the divine nature and which teaches us what god is god is a familiar idea but an idea which has still to be scientifically developed the result of philosophic examination is that god is the absolute truth the universal in and for itself embracing all things and in which all things subsist and in regard to this assertion we may appeal in the first place to the religious consciousness and to its conviction that god is the absolute truth whence all things proceed whither they all return upon which all things depend and in respect of which nothing can possess a true and absolute independence the heart may very well be full of this representation of god but science is not built up of what is in the heart the object of science is that which has arisen to the level of consciousness and of thinking consciousness that is in other words that which has attained to the form of thought in so much as he is the universal god is for us in relation to development being enclosed in itself being at unity with itself being capitalized when we say god is being enclosed in itself we enunciate a proposition which is bound to a development which we await but this envelopment of god in himself which we have called his universality we must not conceive relatively to god himself and his content as an abstract universality outside of which and as opposed to which the particular has an independent existence so we must consider this universal as an absolute concrete universal this sense of fullness is the sense in which god is one and there is but one god that is to say god is not one merely by contrast with other gods but because it is he that is the one that is god the things which are the developments of the worlds of nature and of mind show a multiplicity of forms and an infinite variety of existences but whatever may be their difference of degree of force of content these things have no true independence their being is consequent and so to speak contingent 
when we predicate being of particular things it is not of being capitalized which is absolute that we speak being capitalized of and from itself that is god but a borrowed being a semblance of being god in his universality that is this universal being which has no limit no bounds no particularity is a being which subsists absolutely and which subsists alone all else which subsists has its root in this unity and by this alone subsists in thus representing to ourselves this first content we may say that god is absolute substance the only veritable reality for not everything which has a reality has a reality of its own or subsists by itself god is the only absolute reality and thereby the absolute substance if we stop at this abstract thought we have spinozism for in spinozism subjectivity is not yet differentiated from substantiality from substance as such but in the presupposition just made there is also this thought god is spirit absolute and eternal spirit which comes not forth from itself in differentiation this ideality this subjectivity of spirit which is transparency ideality excluding all particular determination is precisely the universal pure relation to self being capitalized which remains absolutely within itself if we halt at substance we fail to grasp this universal under its concrete form in its concrete determination spirit always preserves its unity this unity of its reality which we call substance but one should add that this substantiality the unity of the absolute reality with itself is but the foundation but a moment in the determination of god as spirit hence principally arises the reproach which is directed against philosophy to wit that philosophy to be consistent with itself is necessarily spinozism and consequently atheism and fatalism but at the beginning we have not yet determinations distinguished one from another as i and nay we have the one but not the other consequently what we have here is to start with content under the form of substance even when we say god spirit we have only words indeterminate representations the essential point is to know what has been produced in the consciousness and that is first the simple the abstract here in this first simple determination we have god only under the form of universality only we do not halt at this moment nevertheless this content remains the foundation of all further development for in these developments god comes forth from his unity when god creates the world to use the expression of every day there comes not into existence an evil a contrary existing in itself independently of god three god exists for thought this beginning with a capital b is an object for us or a content in us we possess this object immediately the question arises who are we we i spirit here also is a complex being a multiplied being i have perceptions i see i hear etc seeing hearing all this is i consequently the precise sense of this question is which among these determinations is it in accordance with which this content exists for our minds idea will imagination feeling which is the seat the proper domain of this content of this object if we accept the common answers to this question god will abide in us as the object of faith of feeling of representation of knowledge we shall have to examine more closely later on in a special fashion with respect to this point these forms faculties aspects of ourselves 
in this place we shall not seek to reply to this question nor shall we say basing our answer on experience and observation that god is in our feeling etc but to begin with we will confine ourselves to what we have actually before us to this one with a capital o to this universal to this concrete being with a capital b if we take this one and ask for what power for what activity of our mind does this one this absolutely universal being exist we cannot but name the one activity of mind which corresponds to it as constituting its proper natural domain this activity which corresponds to the universal is thought thought is the field in which this content moves it is the energizing of the universal or the universal in the reality of its activity or if we say that thought embraces the universal that for which the universal is will still be thought this universal which can be produced by thought and which is for thought may be a quite abstract universal in this sense it is the unlimited the infinite the being without bounds without particular determination this universal negative to begin with has its seat not elsewhere but in thought to think of god is to rise above the things of sense exterior and individual above simple feeling into the region of pure being being at unity with itself that is to say into the pure region of the universal and this region is thought such is the substratum for this content considered on the subjective side here the content is that being with a capital b in which is no difference no schism being which abides in itself the universal and thought is the form for which this universal is thus we have a difference between thought and the universal which we have called god it is a difference which in the first place belongs only to our reflection and is by no means to be found in the content on its own account there is the result to which philosophy comes a result already comprised in religion as under the form of faith to wit that god is the sole veritable reality the being with a capital b without which no other reality would exist in the unity of this reality in this cloudless shining the reality and the distinction which we call thinking being have as yet no place what we have before us is this absolute unity this content this determination we cannot yet call religion because to religion belongs subjective spirit consciousness thought is the seat of this universal but this seat is to begin with absorbed in this being which is one eternal in and for itself this universal constitutes the beginning and the point of departure but only as unity which so abides it is not a mere substratum whence differences are born rather all differences are included in this universal no more is it an abstract an inert universal but the absolute principle of all activity the matrix the infinite source whence all things proceed whither all things return and in which they are eternally preserved thus the universal is never separated from this ethereal element from this unity with the capital u with itself this concentration within itself four what is evil as the universal god could not find himself faced by a contrary whereof the reality should pretend to arise above the phantasmal level for this pure unity and this perfect transparency matter is nothing impenetrable and spirit the ego is not so independent as to possess a true individual substantiality of its own there has been a tendency to label this idea pantheism it would be more exact to call it the conception of substantiality god is first determined as substance only the absolute subject spirit is also substance 
but it is determined rather as subject this is the difference generally ignored by those who assert that speculative philosophy is pantheism as usual they miss the essential point and disparage philosophy by falsifying it pantheism is commonly taken to mean that god is all things the whole the universe the collection of all existences of things infinite and infinitely diverse from which notion the charge is brought against philosophy that it teaches that all things are god that is to say that god is not the universal which is in and for itself but the infinite multiplicity of individual things in their empirical and immediate existence if you say god is all that is here this paper etc you have indeed committed yourself to the pantheism with which philosophy is reproached that is the whole is understood as equivalent to all individual things but there is also the genus which is equally the universal yet is wholly different from this totality in which the universal is but the collection of individual things and the basis the content is constituted by these things themselves to say that there has ever been a religion which has taught this pantheism is to say what is absolutely untrue it has never entered any man's mind that everything is god that is to say that god is things in their individual and contingent existence far less has philosophy ever taught this doctrine spinozism itself as such as well as oriental pantheism contains this doctrine that the divine in all things is no more than that which is universal in their content their essence and in such sense that this essence is conceived of as a determinate essence when brahma says in the metal i am the brightness of its shining among the rivers i am the ganges i am the life of all that lives he thereby expresses the individual he says not i am the metal the rivers the individual things of various kinds as such nor in the fashion of their immediate existence here at this stage what is expressed is no longer pantheism but rather that of the essence of individual things in the living being are time and space but in this individual being it is only the changeless element that is made to stand out quote, the life of being that lives end quote, is in this latter sphere of life the unlimited the universal but if it be said quote, god is all things end quote, here we understand individuality with all its limitations its finity its passing existence this notion of pantheism arises out of the conception of unity not as spiritual unity but abstract unity and then when the idea takes its religious form where only the substance the one o is capitalized is possessed of true reality there is a tendency to forget that it is precisely in presence of this unity that individual and finite things are effaced and to continue to place these in a material fashion side by side with this unity they will not admit the teaching of the eleatics who when they say there is only one with a capital o add expressly that non-entity is not all that is finite would be limitation a negation of the one but non-entity the boundary term limit and that which is limited exists not at all spinozism has been accused of atheism but spinozism does not teach that god is the world that he is all things all things italicized things have indeed a phenomenal existence that is an existence as appearances we speak of our existence and our life is indeed comprised in this existence but to speak philosophically the world has no reality it has no existence 
individual things are finite things to which no reality can be attributed it may be said of them that they have no existence spinozism this is the accusation directed against it involves by way of consequence that if all things make but one good and evil make but one there is no difference between them and thereby all religion is destroyed in themselves it is said there is no difference between good and evil consequently it is a matter of indifference whether one be righteous or wicked it may be granted that in themselves that is in god who is the sole veritable reality the difference between good and evil disappears in god there is no evil but the difference between good and evil can exist only on condition that god is the evil but it cannot be allowed that evil is an affirmative thing and that this affirmation is in god god is good and nothing else than good the distinction between good and evil is not present in this unity in this substance and comes into existence only with differentiation god is unity abiding absolutely in itself in the substance there is no differentiation the distinction of good and evil begins with the distinction of god from the world and particularly from man it is the fundamental principle of spinozism with regard to this distinction of god and the world that man must have no other end than god the love of god therefore it is that spinoza marks out for man as the law to be followed in order to bring about the healing of this breach and it is the loftiest morality that teaches that evil has no existence and that man is not bound to permit the substantial existence of this distinction this negation yet it is possible for him to desire to maintain the difference and even to push it to the point of sheer opposition to god who is the universal self-contained and self-sufficing in this case man is evil but alternatively he may annul this distinction and place his true existence in god alone and in his aspiration towards him and in this case he is good in spinozism there is indeed the difference between good and evil opposition between god and man but side by side with it we have also the principle that evil is to be deemed a non-entity in god as god in god as substance there is no distinction it is for man that the distinction exists as also for him exists the distinction of good and evil five the determination of unity the superficial method of appraising philosophy is exemplified also in those who assert that it is a system of identity it is perfectly true that substance is this unity at one with itself but spirit no less is this self-identity ultimately all is identity unity with itself but when they speak of the philosophy of identity they have in view abstract identity or unity in general and they neglect the essential point to wit the determination of this unity in itself in other words they omit to consider whether this unity is determined as substance or as spirit philosophy from beginning to end is nothing else than the study of determinations of unity in the sphere of the notion with a capital n many unities are comprised the combination of water and earth is a unity but this unity is mixture if we bring together a base and an acid we have as the result a crystal also water but water which cannot be discerned and which gives no trace of humidity hence the unity of the water and of this matter is a unity different from the mixture of water and earth the essential point is the difference of these determinations the unity of god is always unity but what is of primary importance is to know the modes and forms of the determination of this unity manifestation development determination do not go on to infinity nor yet do they stop accidentally but in the course of its true development the notion 
with a capital N, completes its course by a return upon itself, whereby it has attained the reality adequate to it. So it is that the manifestation is infinite in nature, that the content is adequate to the notion of spirit, and that the phenomenal world exists, like spirit, in and for itself. In religion, the notion of religion has become its own object. Spirit, which is in and for itself, has now no longer in its development individual forms and determinations. It knows itself no longer as spirit in such determinability or such a limited moment but it has triumphed over these limitations and this finiteness and is for itself that which also it is in itself this cognizance in which spirit is for itself what it is in itself constitutes the in and for of spirit which is in possession of knowledge the perfect and absolute religion in which is revealed what spirit is what god is that is the Christian religion. End of the Philosophy of Religion by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel Excerpt Practical Skunk Raising A Book of Information Concerning the Raising of Skunks for Profit by William Edwin Pratt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Roger Moline. Practical Skunk Raising by William Edwin Pratt The supply of wild fur has already fallen behind the demand, and the time is in sight when wild fur will form but a small percent of that in use. All furs trapped in steel traps are less beautiful because the animal suffers. It is a well-known fact that the less the animal suffers, the better the fur. The time is not far away when nearly all fur will be grown on fur ranches. Fur farming unquestionably has a great future as an industry. Without detailing countless failures, it is well to begin by disposing of the wrong idea that most people begin with that all they need to do is secure an island or a big fenced area and throw in much feed to a bunch of selected fur bearers and reap a harvest of so many pelts each year the absurdity of this is seen if we compare it to a horse breeder who would put a high fence around a large pasture and turn in a couple stallions and a dozen mares throw in much feed daily and expect a harvest of so many colts each year. No. Success depends on general supervision and control of each individual. Skunks raise a better coat in captivity than when wild, because their food is gotten without hunting for it, and are beyond danger of man, dogs, and other intruders. Striped skunks ten years ago sold for one dollar per pair, while only two dollars per pair was paid for star blacks. Three years ago or more, these prices had doubled, and a skunk with his scent glands out was even more valuable. One male and two females is a good lot to begin with, which would increase to twenty young the first year, and one hundred and fifty the second, providing one could wait that long and one could certainly not expect any dividend until the fifth year. THE GROUND An acre of ground is sufficient to begin with, but one must have it situated so one could increase to perhaps ten acres. It should be high, dry, and sandy, with some grass in the plot, and not too remote from a railway station. THE FENCE an inexpensive fence to begin with may be made by setting posts in the ground close together, but strongly. I recommend a fence made of wire netting or steel set or embedded in the ground from one to two feet. First, dig a trench about one foot wide and two feet deep, and put heavy rock in the bottom, and thus, with the rock below the wire, 
there will be no way that the skunks can escape by digging. The posts should be set ten feet apart. If set farther, the wire will have a tendency to sag. The wire should be one and a half inch mesh for the main fence and one inch mesh for the breeding yards, as young skunks sometimes escape through a one and a half inch mesh. Number 16 or 18 gauge wire from 4 to 8 feet in height should be used. Any smaller gauge than the above mentioned is not durable enough. A wire or board inhang of 12 inches should be placed at the top, rejecting in so the animals can't climb out. This is attached by slats nailed along the tops of the posts and the wire nailed to them. Steel sheeting needs no inhang because it is so that the skunks cannot get a foothold. If the skunks dig at night to get out, fill up the holes as soon as possible and thus discourage the workers. The big pen or large enclosure serves as a range for the barren females, males, and young skunks during autumn. Pens Many breeders consider pens better and cheaper than dens. These are little runs, about ten feet square, separated only by a three-foot netting, which has an inhang or overhang, as it is sometimes called, of a foot on each side, so the skunks cannot climb in or out. If boards are used for pens inside the big fence, no overhang is needed. All pens should be completely floored with mesh wire three or four inches under surface. Dens Every cage or pen needs a movable den that is dry, sanitary, portable, easy for observation, and warm. This last feature is important, for skunks are sensitive to cold which causes pneumonia. The dens should be well supplied with straw and rags, avoid hay because the seeds are injurious to the nostrils cage litter after trying smooth floored dens and floors strewn with straw chips ashes and sawdust i feel safe in recommending sawdust as its great absorbent power helps to keep clean dens it should cover the floor to a depth of two inches food troughs do not use wooden troughs, they are unsanitary. Pie dishes, either tin or ware, will do if the sides do not flare. If they do, the skunk usually spills the milk or any liquid in the dish by standing on the sides with its paws. Food House The food and tool house should be in the pen for convenience. There should be mice and rat-proof vessels to keep the oatmeal and dry biscuit, cheese, and meat in. It should be equipped with a large boiler for boiling oatmeal and meat in. The meat may also be smoked, as this will preserve it and is greatly preferred by the animals. The meat may be hung out of reach of the rats in sacks. Feeding Skunks, like most animals, are omnivorous. A continuous unbroken diet of meat would eventually wipe out the stock, as would a diet solely vegetable. Moderate varied feeling is essential. Adult skunks are fed once a day. They themselves prefer it after dark. Staple articles of food are beef, rabbit, cow liver, chicken giblets, oatmeal, and other porridge, cooked potatoes, and milk. Anything a dog will eat with fruit and insects added. Be sure the meat is clear of infection. Another staple article of food is a bread made of bran and shorts. Mix with three quarters of sour milk enough flour to make a stiff dough. Roll dough out until it is an inch thick and bake for an hour, like bread in a hot oven. This is much relished by all fur-bearing animals, and is still more acceptable if flavored with a few spoonfuls of black molasses. Milk must be given sparingly, unless it agrees with the stock. 
once a week is enough more than that is liable to induce scouring and other disorders half a dog biscuit and a few scraps of meat are enough for a skunk's daily allowance of course some should have more than others according to their needs a brood mother growing or suckling her young should have as much as she can eat twice a day morning and evening when winter comes skunks retire to their dens and eat nothing for weeks in march the feeding is resumed and in april the brood mothers are extra fed with their predominance of meat much of it raw it costs from twenty five cents to a dollar to feed a skunk from june first to december first meat and fresh water are necessary at all times for brood mothers for if this is neglected they will devour the young as soon as born. Water Troughs Skunks drink much and often. They must have plenty of fresh water at all times, especially when the young are expected. The vessel that the water at all times is kept in should be washed every day. In winter, the skunks lap up snow instead of water. Examining Box no cautious man would undertake to examine a wild skunk as he would go a dog or rabbit yet it is important to know sex and condition of each new skunk as it arrives this may be easily and quickly done by means of an examining box this is a small box ten inches by eight inches by six inches covered with a chicken wire of about one inch mesh on the top there should be a six-inch entrance at one end of the box. On the solid wood bottom is a handle, which is, of course, the top when the box is turned wire side down. Chase the skunk in the entrance slowly, and then lift the box up by the handle and look under without fear. As soon as the operation is over, the skunk will seek his proper den. Diseases the keeper should watch the animal's dung. If too fluid or too soft, too copious or too little, there is something wrong. Their appetite and the dung are the great tests. If these are right, there is little chance of anything being wrong. Greed. Some cases often abound among skunks such as overeating, by getting all they can from the other skunks after eating their own food. Such freaks should be isolated and marketed as soon as possible. Cannibalism. Sometimes, when enclosures are small, the mothers devour the young as soon as born. This is sometimes the result of quarreling. Always build the enclosures large enough so the skunks have plenty of room. Murder. Murder must be considered a disease some individuals are incapable of it while others are very prone to it the last mentioned soon make themselves known they should be marketed as soon as possible distemper this may be detected by the animal's eyes and nose running the animal should be sent at once to the hospital and treated by washing the nose and eyes with a solution of boric acid and water Mange. Mange is considered a serious disease and is caused by fleas which induce the animal to scratch. The fur gets thin and the body is covered with scabs. This may be cured by applying a good flea powder and a dip. Worms. Worms may be eliminated by feeding the skunks in a dish of clear, sharp sand. Other foes. While the armed skunk travels about without fear of man or beast, it must be remembered that the disarmed young skunks may be killed by dogs or taken by horned owls or any other large bird. Rats Rats are a great nuisance about a fur ranch. They often dig holes and teach the young skunks the way to escape. They also kill the young and are quick enough to keep out of the way of the mother. Disinfectants 
Those I use are chloride of lime, peroxide of hydrogen, and lysol, 2%. To disinfect a den, put it in a large tub and soak it in sheep dip. To disinfect a corner, sprinkle with chloride of lime. Hospital The hospital is a series of cages, quite removed from the other, with the earth and grass for a floor, and good opportunities for a sun bath. Sick animals should be put in the hospital as soon as noted. Breeding and Winter Management The stock should be mated about November or December. Put one male to four or five females. It is well to watch them for a few days to make sure the group is harmonious. Often it happens that one female will quarrel with the others. She should be removed and tried somewhere else. If one is seen outside the den constantly, this is the cause. Put plenty of straw in the den, and they will make themselves comfortable enough. During the winter they eat nothing. Some breeders deem it wise to feed a light meal a week. Mating time is from the middle of March, starting with February. Males must not meet at this time, for they will fight until one or the other is killed. Barren females. Three or four days after mating season has set in, remove the male and try some other male in or for a few days, as the males are decided in their likes and dislikes. Neglect of this precaution will result in a large proportion of barren females. Breeding mothers. By April 1st, every female should be given a separate den and well fed and cared for. This is the most important time of all. Success or failure depends on the management of the mother at this time. Toward the end of the month, she should be given raw meat and plenty of water. This diet should be given until mid-May, as this allays the meat craving which causes the mother to devour the newborn young. I will repeat again the watchwords of success. Proper sanitation, seclusion, and quiet. An abundance of raw meat and fresh water. The period of gestation is nine weeks. The young are born in mid-May. The young females have from four to six young the first litter, and the older females have from eight to sixteen to one litter. Never put two females with young in the same house, for they will fight and steal one another's young. One family in one house is a good old rule to observe. When one month old, they are able to walk around and drink milk. I would advise disarming and weaning at this time. Young The young grow very fast and soon become as tame as kittens, some show their amazing temper at this age from the beginning. At thirty days they walk alone and drink milk. At sixty days they will weigh on the average of six pounds each and appear to be half grown. At six months they are full grown and weigh from four to six pounds. At this age they are ready to be marketed. Escapes it is well to be prepared for escapes. A properly constructed fence will prevent this. Two contrivances should be in stock, net and traps. Net. This is an ordinary dip net to put over them. Traps. These are box traps or catch-alives. They are easily constructed and one half dozen will be found convenient for many purposes. Disarming. To prevent a shot from this deadly battery of the skunk, they are disarmed while very young. When animals are young, the operation is a simple one, but when performed, when they are grown, not more than one out of three survives the operation. When ready for disarming, spread a burlap or gunny sack across your lap and order the assistant to bring the skunk. He must be careful to hold it by the tail with it near the ground. 
The sack is then rolled around the animal, rear exposed. The assistant holds the animal firmly and double muffles the eyes so it cannot possibly see. A skunk seldom shoots unless it sees an enemy. The proper instruments consist of a scalpel, clamping forceps, extracting forceps, hook and goggles. The scent sacks are located one on each side of the vent, off one-fourth inch from the vent. To disarm, first make an incision three-eighths of an inch long and one-half an inch from the vent. As soon as the incision is made, cut deeper until the scent sack appears, which is about the size of a bean in young skunks and about the size of a marble in mature ones. With the blunt forceps, force the adhering muscles down off the sack and cut the sack off one-fourth inch from the vent. If the operation is done according to instructions, there will be no loss whatever. Animals do not require disarming unless they are going to be shipped. If skunks are raised solely for fur, it is just as well to leave them armed. Express companies refuse to ship them unless scent sacks are removed. How to Ship Skunk Secure them when ready for market by using a box trap. Never try to handle them. To ship them, put each in a small soap box lined with tin. Cut a hole three inches square in the side and cover it with wire of one inch mesh. Fasten a tin in one corner of the box, three inches from the bottom, for water. Above this, make a hole to pour water through. Mark it, water here. Make a lid in the box for convenience in feeding. One pound of dog biscuits, or bread, and a few scraps of meat will amply supply a skunk on the road. Label the bag, seven days food. Do not fear to lift the lid and look in, for a skunk must be greatly alarmed and provoked before discharging musk. Conclusion If the material in this book is thoroughly understood and mastered, and the reader is the proud possessor of two star-black skunks in a plot, fenced secure against escape, in five years he can reap large dividends. End of Practical Skunk Raising by William Edwin Pratt This recording has been by Roger Moline. The Questioning Mania From Mind A Quarterly Review of Psychology and Philosophy Edited by George Croom Robertson Volume 1 1876, page 413. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Under the name of Grubelsucht, Greisinger a few years ago described three examples of a peculiar mental condition characterized by continuous uncontrollable questionings as to the origin and causes of things great and small. Dr. Oscar Berger, parenthesis, Archiv für Psychiatrie BD 6 Heft 1, in parenthesis, describes two similar cases and considers the symptom in detail. The condition has very distinct pathological relations, but does not seem to have been associated in any case with insanity. The sufferers were, for the most part, men of early adult life. In some cases, other symptoms indicative of irritable weakness of the nervous system were present. The symptom was a transient one, and quite different from the habitual mode of thought. There was an incessant subtle questioning as to the grounds of all things, a continuous why and wherefore, accompanying every idea to the great annoyance of the sufferer. 
it was not quiet reflection but a continuous irresistible pressure of thought constantly seeking impossible answers and ever recommencing disturbing and even alarming the sufferer how is it that men are only of the size they are why are they not as large as houses why are there not two suns and two moons instead of one the same questions and new forms would occupy the sufferer for hours in one case the first symptom was a kind of morbid precision an impulse to secure at any expense of time and trouble an absolute accuracy in the most trivial things the patient soon after began the questioning and was speedily in a labyrinth of problems the solution of which he felt compelled to attempt although conscious of its impossibility in the other case the condition was constantly present in slight degree but was subject to paroxysmal exacerbations in which the patient was conscious of a peculiar mental dualism or separation of his mental powers one part rushing into all possible and impossible speculative regions while the other the temperate judgment endeavored to quell the excited questioning the attacks lasted one or several hours other characteristics of this patient's permanent mental state were a peculiar realism so that it was difficult for him to believe that that which he dreamed or read of was not fact and a peculiar sensation of change in the relative proportions of himself and the objects by which he was surrounded dr berger assumes that a morbid state of the cerebral convolutions underlies this condition he points out that the pathological phenomena have certain physiological analogues which are tolerably familiar end of the questioning mania from mind the quarterly review of psychology and philosophy volume one 1876あすみステース、ノートネアマチュア、ヴネテリアヴタイス、ウォーカーウォーカー。This is a Ripple Fox recording. All Ripple Fox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit ripplefox.org. Let us reach the climax on Saturday regarding the controversy which is taking place in Victoria and in New South Wales as the Ripple Frank Bowler pair, the ex champion swimmer, had forwarded his amateur status by establishing a salary deployment in the education department as a teacher of swimming in the schools. The Victorian Amateur Swimming Association has declared Borobet ineligible under the amateur definition to compete in its competitions. Efforts were made recently to have the rules of the Australian Amateur Swimming Union altered in order that Borobet might retain his amateur status, and as the result of a mail vote which was taken, Victoria and so share phone for the alteration and New South Wales against, the executive of the union declared to alter the rules, as to do so would require a statutory majority of all the parties to the union agree meant Borupair precipitated mass by entering for the half-mile challenge of Victoria, which was decided at Brighton on Saturday. When it became known that Borupair was an entrant, the question arose whether in the event of Borupair being a well to start, other compares would injure the amateur status, and at the meeting of the association, the statute was fully fleshed out, with the result as stated. End of a summer stairs, not an amateur. From the daily advertiser, Walker Walker. Read by Greta O'Brien. A Treatise on the Culture of the Tobacco Plant by Jonathan Carver, Esquire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Roger Moline. A Treatise on the Culture of the Tobacco Plant by Jonathan Carver, Esquire. Chapter 1 Of the Discovery and Use of Tobacco Tobacco, or tobacco, is a medicinal plant which remained unknown to Europeans till the discovery of America by the Spaniards being first imported from thence about the year 1560. 
The Americans of the continent call it Petin, those of the islands Yoli. Hernandez de Toledo sent it into Spain from Tobacco, a province of Yucatan, where he first found and learned its use, and from which place he gave it the denomination it still bears. Sir Walter Raleigh first introduced the use of it into England in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, about the year 1585. The plant was probably known in this kingdom before that time, by means of the Spaniards or Portuguese. It is, however, certain that he first taught the English to smoke it. The French, on its first introduction among them, gave it various names, as Nicotiana, or the ambassador's herb, from John Nico, who came soon after it was discovered, as ambassador to that court, from Francis the Second of Portugal, and brought some of it with him, which he presented to a grand prior of the house of Lorraine, and to Queen Catherine de Medici. On this account it was sometimes called the grand prior's herb, and sometimes the queen's herb. When, or in what manner this plant was introduced into the Oriental nations is uncertain, although it is at present in general use among them. Considerable quantities of it are likewise cultivated in the Levant, the coasts of Greece, and the archipelago, on the islands of Malta, and in Italy. Tobacco is termed by botanists Nicotiana, and is arranged by them as a genus of the Patandria monogenia class of plants. It is sometimes used medicinally, but being very powerful in its operations, this must be done with great caution. The most common use of it are either as a sternutatory, when taken by way of snuff, as a masticatory, by chewing it in the mouth, or as an effluvia, by smoking it. And when used with moderation, it is not an unhealthy amusement, whether it replenishes the humble pouch of the rustic or the golden box of the courtier. Before pipes were invented, it was usually smoked in cigars, and they are still in use among some of the southern nations. The method of preparing these is at once simple and expeditious, a leaf of tobacco being formed into a small twisted roll somewhat larger than the stem of a pipe, and about eight inches long. The smoke is conveyed through the winding folds, which prevent it from expanding, as through a tube, so that one end of it being lighted and the other applied to the mouth, it is in this form used without much inconvenience. But in process of time, pipes being invented, they were found more commodious vehicles for the smoke and are now in general use. Among all the productions of foreign climes introduced into these kingdoms, Scarcely any has been held in higher estimation by persons of every rank than tobacco. In the countries in which it is a native, it is considered by the Indians as the most valuable offering that can be made to the beings they worship. They use it in all their civil and religious ceremonies. When once its spiral wreaths ascend from the feathered pipe of peace, the compact that has just been made is considered as sacred and inviolable. Likewise, when they address their great father or his guardian spirits, residing as they believe in every extraordinary production of nature, they make liberal offerings of this valuable plant to them, doubting not but that they secure thereby the protection they request. Smoking was, at first, supposed to be the only means by which its virtues could be attained. But at length it was found out that the juices of it extracted by chewing were of a cordial nature, alleviating, in laborious employments, the cravings of hunger or the depression of fatigue, and also that the powder of it received into the head through the nostrils in moderate quantities was a salubrious and refreshing sternutatory. For these purposes, the Americans inhabiting the interior settlements manufacture it in the following easy manner. Being possessed of a tobacco wheel, which is a very simple machine, they spin the leaves, after they are properly cured, into a twist of any size they think fit. 
and having folded it into rolls of about twenty pounds weight each, they lay it by for use. In this state it will keep for several years, and be continually improving, as it every hour grows milder. When they have occasion to use it, they take off such a length as they think necessary, which, if designed for smoking, they cut into small pieces, for chewing into longer, as choice directs. If they intend to make snuff of it, they take a quantity from the roll, and laying it in a room where a fire is kept, in a day or two it will become dry, and being rubbed on a grater will produce a genuine snuff. Those in more improved regions, who like their snuff scented, may apply to it such odiferous waters as they can procure, or think most pleasing. The Illinois usually form it into carrots, which is done by laying a number of leaves, when cured, on each other, after the ribs have been taken out, and rolling them round with pack thread, till they become cemented together. These rolls commonly measure about eighteen or twenty inches long, and nine round in the middle part. But as many other methods are at present well known in England, that probably answer the purpose full as well as these, it is almost unnecessary to describe them. These directions are here given for the benefit of those who raise tobacco for their own use, and choose to make their snuff without applying to the manufacturer for it. Among the articles of commerce tobacco holds a distinguished rank, and affords no inconsiderable addition to the revenues of the state. Before the present unhappy dissensions broke out between Great Britain and America, about 96,000 hogsheads were annually imported from Maryland and Virginia. 13,500 of which were consumed at home, the duty of which, at the rate of 26 per hogshead, amounted to 351,765. The remaining 82,500 hogsheads were exported to various parts of Europe, and their value received in specie or the produce of those countries. To the uses already enumerated, I shall add another to which tobacco might be applied, that I believe has never been made known to Europeans, and which will render it much more estimable than any of the foregoing. It has been found by the Americans to answer the purpose of tanning leather, as well, if not better, than bark, and was not the latter so plentiful in their country, would be generally used by them instead of it. I have been witness to many experiments wherein it has been proved successful, especially on the thinner sort of hides, and can safely pronounce it to be, in countries where bark is scarce, a valuable substitute for that article. Chapter 2. A Description of the Plant and its Flowers There are several species of the tobacco plant, and these are chiefly distinguishable by their flowers and the junction of the leaves to the stalks. But as this is not intended for a botanical treatise, I shall confine my description to those sorts which are cultivated in the colonies for exportation. These are two, the Orinoco and the Sweet-Scented, which differ from each other in no respect but in the shape of their leaves, those of the former being longer and narrower than the latter. Both are tall, herbaceous plants, of an erect growth and notable foliage, rising each with a strong stem in their native soil, to the height of from six to nine feet. The stalk is upwards of an inch diameter near the root, and surrounded with a kind of hairy or velvet clammy substance of a yellowish-green color. The leaves, which are rather of a deeper green, grow to the stalk alternately at the distance of about two or three inches from each other. They are oblong, of a pear-shaped oval, and simple, without pedicles embracing the stalk by an auriculated base. The largest are about twenty inches long, decreasing in size as they ascend, 
till they are no longer than ten inches and nearly half as broad. The face of the leaves is much undulated or corrugated, not unlike those of spinach when full ripe. In their first state, at the time they do not exceed five or six inches, the leaves are usually of a full green and rather smooth, but as they increase in size, they acquire a yellowish cast and become rougher. The stern and branches are terminated by large bunches of flowers, collected into clusters of a delicate red, the edges, when quite blown, inclining to a pale purple. The flowers continue in succession until the end of summer, when they make room for the seed. These are of a brown color, kidney-shaped, and very small, each capsule generally containing about a thousand, and the whole produce of a single plant is estimated at 350,000. The seeds are usually ripe in the month of September, and when perfectly dry may be rubbed out and preserved in bags till the following season. The Orinoco, or as it is termed by the seedsman, the Long Virginia, appears to me to be the sort best suited to bear the rigor of a northern climate. The strength of the plant, as well as the scent and efficacy of the leaves being greater than the other. The sweet-scented flourishes most in a sandy soil and warm countries, where it greatly exceeds the former in the celerity of its growth, and although, as I have before observed, it differs from the Orinoco only in the shape of its leaves, being shorter and rounder, yet it is unlike in its strength and flavor, being agreeable to its name, much milder and pleasanter. As a species of garden plants, the Nicotiana is an ornamental annual for the pleasure ground, as it attains a majestic stature, and being adorned with fine, luxuriant leaves and large clusters of pleasing flowers which terminate all the shoots, during the autumn it exhibits an elegant appearance. For a more complete idea of the Orinoco plant and its flowers, the reader is referred to the plate prefixed to this work, but it must be observed that the number of leaves represented on the stock is not designed to serve as a rule for topping the tobacco, as directed in the fourth chapter. Only a few of them are annexed to the stock, that the representation of the leaf might be the more complete. Chapter 3. Of the Soil and Situation Most Proper for Raising the Plant The best ground for raising the plant is a warm, kindly, rich soil that is not subject to be overrun with weeds, for from these it must be totally cleared. The soil in which it grows in its native climate, Virginia, is inclined to sandy, consequently warm and light. The nearer, therefore, the nature of the land in which it is planted in England approaches to that the great probability there is of its flourishing here. Other kinds of soils may probably be brought to suit it by a mixture with some attenuating species of manure, but a knowledge of this must be the result of repeated trials. It must, however, be remembered that whatever manure is added to the soil must be thoroughly incorporated with it. The situation most preferable for a plantation is the southern declivity of a hill, rather gradual than abrupt, or a spot that is sheltered by a wall, a bank, or any other means from the blighting north winds which so frequently blow during the spring months in this island. But at the same time, it is necessary to observe that the plants must enjoy a free current of air, for if that be obstructed, they will not prosper. Chapter 4 Of Its Culture With a Description of the Worm That Annoys It As the tobacco plant, being an annual, is only to be raised from seed, I would particularly recommend to such as means to cultivate it the greatest care in purchasing these 
lest by sowing such as is not good they lose, with their expected crop, the season. The different sorts of the seeds, not being distinguishable like the plants from each other, nor the goodness to be ascertained by their appearance, the purchaser, till he has raised a supply from his own cultivation, must depend on the veracity of the seedsman, who may be also sometimes deceived, having nothing to rely on but the honor of the person who raised it. Prudence, therefore, requires that he should apply to a person of character in that profession. In describing the manner in which the plant ought to be raised from the seed, as well as in the succeeding process, I shall confine myself, without regarding the methods usually pursued in Virginia or Maryland, which, from the difference of the climate, can be of little service here, to the practice of the northern colonies of America, as these are more parallel in their latitude to England. And there being even a difference between the climate of these and that of Great Britain, to the disadvantage of the latter, I mean with regard to the cultivation of the tobacco plant, I shall minutely attend to this variation, and in the directions I give, endeavor to guard against the inconveniences of it. These instructions shall likewise be given in plain and familiar terms, and not in a language that can be only understood by the botanist or gardener, that this treatise may be of general use. About the middle of April, or rather sooner in a forward spring, for the season must be attended to, as this plant will not bear forcing, sow the seed in beds first prepared for that purpose, composed of such soil as before described, mixed with some warm, rich manure. In a cold spring, regular hotbeds would be most eligible for this purpose, and indeed the gardeners of this country are persuaded that the Nicotiana cannot be raised in any other way. But as these are seldom to be found in the garden of the farmer, and as I am convinced that if the weather is not remarkably severe, they might be reared without doors, for his benefit I shall give the following instructions relative to their treatment. Having sown the seed in the manner directed, on the least apprehension of a frost after the plants appear, it will be necessary to spread mats over the beds, a little elevated from the ground by poles laid across, that they may not be crushed. These, however, must be removed in the morning soon after the sun appears, that they may receive as much benefit as possible from its warmth and from the air. In this manner, proceed till the leaves have attained the size of about two inches in length and one in breadth, which they will do in about a month after they are sown, or near the middle of May, when the frosts usually are at an end. One invariable rule for their being able to bear removal is, when the fourth leaf is sprouted and the fifth just appears. Then take the opportunity of the first rains, or gentle showers, to transplant them into such a soil and situation as before described. This must be done in the following manner. The land must be plowed, or dug up with spades, and made as mellow and light as possible. Where the plants are to be placed, raise with the hoe small hillocks at the distance of two feet, or a little more, from each other, taking care that no hard sods or lumps are in it, and then just indent the middle of each without drilling holes, as for some other plants. When your ground is thus prepared, dig a gentle manner from their native bed such plants as are arrived at the state before mentioned, and drop, as you pass, one on every hillock. Insert a plant gently into each center, pressing the soil around it with your fingers, and taking the greatest care during the operation that you do not break off any of the leaves, which are at this time exquisitely tender. If the weather proves dry, after they are thus transplanted, they must be watered with soft water, 
in the same manner as is usually done to coal-warts or plants of a similar kind. Notwithstanding you now appear to have a sufficient quantity of plants for the space you intend to cultivate, yet it is necessary that you continue to attend to your bed of seedlings, that you may have enough to supply any deficients which, through accident, might arise. From this time great care must be taken to keep the ground soft and free from weeds, by often stirring with your hoe the mold round the roots and to prune off the dead leaves that sometimes are found near the bottom of the stalk. The difference of this climate from that in which I have been accustomed to observe the progress of this plant will not permit me to direct with certainty the time which is most proper to take off the top of it, to prevent it from running to seed. This knowledge can only be perfectly acquired by experience. When it has risen to upwards of two feet, it commonly begins to put forth the branches on which the flowers and seeds are produced. But as this expansion, if suffered to take place, would drain the nutriment from the leaves, which are the most valuable part, and thereby lessen their size and efficacy, it becomes needful at this stage to nip off the extremity of the stalk to prevent its growing higher. In some other climates, the top is commonly cut off when the plant has fifteen leaves. If the tobacco is intended to be a little stronger than usual, this is done when it has only thirteen, and sometimes, when it is chosen to be remarkably powerful, eleven or twelve leaves only are allowed to expand. On the contrary, if the planter is desirous to have his crop very mild, he suffers it to put forth eighteen or twenty, but in this calculation the three or four lower leaves next the ground, which do not grow so large and fine as the others, are not to be reckoned. This is denominated topping the tobacco, and is much better done by the finger and thumb than with any instrument, because the former close at the same time the pores of the plant, whereas when it is done with the latter, the juices are in some degree exhausted. And though this might appear unimportant, yet every method that tends to give vigor to the leaves should be carefully pursued. For the same reason, care must be taken to nip off the sprouts that will be continually springing up at the junction of the leaves with the stalks. This is termed succoring or succoring the tobacco and ought to be repeated as often as occasion requires. The last, and not the least concern in the cultivation of this plant, is the destruction of the worm that nature has given it for an enemy, and which, like many other reptiles, preys on its benefactor. To destroy these, which are the only insects that molest this plant, or at least to keep them under, for it is impossible totally to exterminate them, every leaf must be carefully searched. As soon as a wound is discovered, and it will not be long before it is perceptible, care must be taken to destroy the cause of it, who will be found near it, and from his unsubstantial texture, which I shall describe at the conclusion of this chapter, be easily crushed but the best method is to pluck it away by the horn and then crush it. Without a constant attention to these noxious insects, a whole field of plants may be soon destroyed, and even if any of them are left in the leaves, during the cure they prove equally destructive. This is termed worming the tobacco, and as these worms are found most predominant the latter end of July and the beginning of August, they must be particularly attended to at that season. As I have just observed, that it is impossible without experience to point out the due time for topping the plant, so it is equally as impossible to ascertain the time it will take to ripen in this climate. That can only be known by future observations. For as it is at present only cultivated in England as an ornament for the garden, no attention has, I believe, 
been hitherto bestowed on the preservation of its leaves. The apparent signs, however, of its maturity are these. The leaves, as they approach a state of ripeness, become more corrugated or rough, and when fully ripe, appear mottled with yellowish spots on the raised parts, whilst the cavities retain their usual green color. They are, at this time, also thicker than they have before been, and are covered with a kind of downy velvet, in the same manner as the stalks are described to be in the preceding chapter. If heavy rains happen at this critical period, they will wash this excrescent substance off, and thereby damage the plants. In this case, if the frosty nights are not begun, it is proper to let them stand a few days longer, when, if the weather be more moderate, they will recover this substance again. But if a frost unexpectedly happens during the night, they must be carefully examined in the morning before the sun has any influence on them, and those which are found to be covered with frosty particles, whether thoroughly ripe or not, must be cut up, for though they may not all appear to be arrived at a state of maturity, yet they cannot be far from it, and will differ but little in goodness from those that are perfectly so. Having now given every instruction that occurs to my memory relative to the culture of the plant, I shall proceed, as proposed, to describe the worm that infests it. It is of the horn species, and appears to be peculiar to this plant, so that in many parts of America it is distinguished by the name of the tobacco worm. In what manner it is first produced, or how propagated, is uncertain, but doubtless by the same inexplicable means that nature makes use of to continue the existence of many other classes of this minute part of the creation. The first time it is discernible is when the plants have gained about half their height, it then appears to be nearly as large as a gnat, soon after which it lengthens into a worm, and by degrees increases in magnitude to the size of a man's finger. In shape it is regular from its head to its tail, without any diminution at either extremity. Indented or ribbed round at equal distances, nearly a quarter of an inch from each other, and having at every one of these divisions a pair of feet or claws by which it fastens itself to the plant. Its mouth, like that of the caterpillar, is placed under the forepart of the head. On the top of the head, between the eyes, grows a horn about half an inch in length and greatly resembling a thorn, the extreme part of which is its color brown, of a firm texture, and sharp pointed. By this horn, as before observed, it is usually plucked from the leaf. It is easily crushed, being only to appearance a composition of green juice enclosed by a membranous covering without the internal parts of an animated being. The color of its skin is in general green, interspersed with spots of a yellowish white and the whole covered with a short hair, scarcely to be discerned. To preserve the planter from the ravages of an insect so destructive to his plantation, as he will thereby be able to distinguish it with a greater degree of precision, I have given in the front piece as exact a representation of it as can be done from memory. Chapter 5 of the manner in which it is usually cured. When the plant is found, agreeable to the preceding directions, to be fit for gathering, on the first morning that promises a fair day, before the sun is risen, take an axe or a long knife, and holding the stalk near the top with one hand, sever it from its root with the other, as low as possible. Having done this, lay it gently on the ground, so as to not break off the leaves, and there let it remain exposed to the rays of the sun throughout the day, 
or until the leaves are entirely wilted, as it is termed in America, that is, till they become limber and will bend any way without breaking. But if, on the contrary, the rain should continue without any intervals, and the plants appear to be full ripe, they must be cut down and housed immediately. This must be done, however, with great care that the leaves, which are in this state very brittle, may not be broken. Being placed under proper shelter, either in a barn or a covered hovel, where they cannot be affected by the rain or too much air, they must be thinly scattered on the floor, and if the sun does not appear for several days so that they can be laid out again, they must remain to wilt in that manner, which is not indeed so desirable as in the sun, nor will the tobacco prove quite so good. When the leaves have acquired the flexibility before described, the plants must be laid in heaps, or rather in one heap, if the quantity be not too great, and in about twenty-four hours they will be found to sweat. But during this time, when they have lain for a little while and begin to ferment, it is necessary to turn them, bringing those which are in the middle to the surface, and placing those which were at the surface in the middle, that by this means the whole quantity may be equally fermented. The longer they lie in this situation, the darker colored the tobacco becomes. This is termed sweating the tobacco. After they have lain in this manner for three or four days, for in a longer time they may heat so much to grow moldy, the plants may be fastened together in pairs, with cords or wooden pegs near the bottom of the stalk, and hung across a pole, with the leaves suspended in the same covered place, a proper interval being left between each pair. In about a month the leaves will be thoroughly dried, and of a proper temperature to be taken down. This state may be ascertained by their appearing of the same color as those imported from America, with which few are unacquainted. But this can be done at no other season than during wet weather, for the tobacco being a plant greatly abounding with salts, it is always affected if there is the least humidity in the atmosphere, even though it be hung in a dry place. If this rule be not observed, but they are removed in dry weather, the external parts of the leaves will crumble into dust, and a considerable waste will attend its removal. As soon as the plants are taken down, they must once more be laid in a heap, and pressed with heavy logs of wood for about a week. This climate, however, may require a longer time. While they remain in this state, it will be necessary to introduce your hand frequently into the heap to discover whether the heat be not too intense, for in large quantities this will sometimes be the case, and considerable damage will accrue from it. When they are found to heat too much, that is, when the heat exceeds a moderate glowing warmth, part of the weight by which they are compressed must be taken away and the cause being removed, the effect will cease. This is called the second or last sweating. And when completed, which it generally will be in about the time just mentioned, the leaves may be stripped from the stalks for use. Many omit this last operation, but I think it takes away any remaining harshness and renders the tobacco more mellow. The strength of the stalk also is diffused by it through the leaves, and the whole mass becomes equally meliorated. When the leaves are stripped from the stalks, they are to be tied up in bunches or hands, and kept in a cellar or any other place that is damp. Though if not handled in dry weather, but only during a rainy season, it is of little consequence in what part of the house or barn they are laid up. At this period the tobacco is thoroughly cured, and equally as proper for manufacturing as that imported from the colonies. Having gone through the whole process, if it has been properly managed, 
That raw, fiery taste so frequently found in the common sale tobacco will be totally eradicated, and though it retains all its strength, will be soft and pleasing in its flavor. Those who are curious in their tobacco in the northern colonies of America sprinkle it, when made up into the rolls for keeping, described in the first chapter, with small common white wines or cider instead of salt water, which gives it an inexpressibly fine flavor. Appendix That estrangement which at present subsists between Great Britain and the American colonies renders a supply of the article of which I treat, and which has become so essentially necessary to the happiness of a great number of His Majesty's subjects, very uncertain. It depends, in a great measure, on the prizes, freighted with this commodity, that happen to be taken, and on the quantities which are imported from other commercial states at a high price. It is therefore to be hoped that the legislature will take into consideration so important a concern and pursue such measures as will conduce to remove this uncertainty, a remedy is at hand, that of cultivating it in these kingdoms, but this appears to be prohibited by the following ancient acts of Parliament. In an act of Charles the Second, entitled, An Act for Prohibiting the Planting, Setting, or Sowing Tobacco in England and Ireland, the prohibition is thus expressed. Your Majesty's loyal and obedient subjects, the lords and commons in this present parliament assembled, considering of how great concern and importance it is that the colonies and plantations of this kingdom in America be defended, protected, maintained, and kept up, and that all due and possible encouragement be given unto them, and that not only in regard great and considerable dominions and countries have been thereby gained, and added to the imperial crown of this realm, but for that the strength and welfare of this kingdom do very much depend upon them in regard of the employment of a very considerable part of its shipping and seamen, and of the vent of very great quantities of its native commodities and manufactures, as also of its supply with several considerable commodities, which it was wont formerly to have only from foreigners, and at far dearer rates, and forasmuch as tobacco is one of the main products of several of those plantations, and upon which their welfare and subsistence, and the navigation of this kingdom, and vent of its commodities thither, do much depend, and in regard it is found by experience, that by the planting of tobacco in these parts, your majesty is deprived of a considerable part of your revenue arising by customs upon imported tobacco, do most humbly pray that it may be enacted by your majesty, and it is hereby enacted by the king's most excellent majesty, and the lords and commons in this present parliament assembled, and by authority of the same, that no person or persons whatsoever shall or do from and after the first day of January in the year of our Lord one thousand six hundred and sixty set, plant, improve to grow, make or cure any tobacco either in seed, plant, or otherwise in or upon any ground, earth, field, or place within the kingdom of England, dominion of Wales, islands of Guernsey or Jersey, or town of Berwick upon Tweed, or in the kingdom of Ireland, under the penalty of the forfeiture of all such tobacco, or the value thereof, or of the sum of forty shillings for every rod or pole of ground so planted, set, or sown as aforesaid, and so proportionably for a greater or lesser quantity of ground, one moiety thereof to his majesty, his heirs and successors, and the other moiety to him or them that shall sue for the same to be recovered by bill, plaint, or information in any court of record, 
wherein no ensoin, protection, or wager in law shall be allowed, provided always, and it is hereby enacted, that this act, nor anything therein contained, shall extend to the hindering of the planting of tobacco in any physic garden of either university or in any other private garden for physic or chirurgery, only so as the quantity so planted exceed not half of one pole in any one place or garden. In this act all sheriffs, justices of the peace, or other officers, upon information or complaint made unto them, are empowered to cause to be burnt, plucked up, consumed, or utterly destroyed all such tobacco set, sown, planted, or growing within their jurisdiction. But it not proving forcible enough to prevent the cultivation of tobacco, in the fifteenth year of the reign of the said king, a clause was inserted in an act entitled, An Act for the Encouragement of Trade, to the following purport, Clause 18. And forasmuch as planting and making tobacco within the kingdom of England doth continue and increase to the apparent loss of his said majesty in his customs, the discouragement of the English plantations in the parts beyond the seas, and prejudice of this kingdom in general, notwithstanding an act of parliament, made in the twelfth year of his said majesty's reign for prevention thereof entitled an act for prohibiting the planting setting or sowing of tobacco in england and ireland and forasmuch as it is found by experience that the reason why the said planting and making of tobacco doth continue is that the penalties prescribed and appointed by that law are so little as to have neither power or effect on the transgressors thereof. For remedy, therefore, of so great an evil, be it enacted by the authority aforesaid, that all and every the person or persons whatsoever that do or shall at any time hereafter set, plant, or sow any tobacco in seed, plant, or otherwise, in or upon any ground, field, earth, or place within the kingdom of England, etc., shall over and above the penalty of the said act for that purpose ordained, for every such offence forfeit and pay the sum of ten pounds for every rod or pole of ground that he or they shall so plant, set, or sow with tobacco, and so proportionably for a greater or lesser quantity of ground, one-third part thereof to the king, one other third part to the poor of such respective parish or parishes wherein such tobacco shall be so planted, and the other third thereof to him or them that shall sue for the same. Physic gardens accepted as before. This penalty also proving insufficient to put a stop to the cultivation, it was found necessary in the twenty-second year of the reign of the said Charles the Second to enforce it by the following act, entitled, An Act to Prevent the Planting of Tobacco in England and Regulating the Plantation Trade. Whereas the sowing, setting, planting, and curing of tobacco within diverse parts of the kingdom of England doth continue and increase, to the apparent loss of his majesty's customs and the discouragement of his majesty's plantations in america and great prejudice of the trade and navigation of this realm and the vent of its commodities thither notwithstanding an act of parliament made in the twelfth year of his majesty's reign that now is for the prevention thereof entitled an act for prohibiting the planting, setting, or sowing of tobacco in England and Ireland, and also one other act of this present Parliament, made in the fifteenth year of his said Majesty's reign, entitled, An Act for the Encouragement of Trade, and forasmuch as the remedies and provisions by these laws are found not large enough to obviate and prevent the planting thereof, be it therefore enacted by the king's most excellent majesty, 
by and with the advice and consent of the lords spiritual and temporal and commons in parliament assembled and by the authority of the same that from and after the first day of may which shall be in the year of our lord one thousand six hundred and seventy one all justices of the peace within their several limits and jurisdictions shall and do a month before every general quarter sessions to be holden for their respective counties issue forth their warrants to all high constables petty constables and tithing men within their several limits thereby requiring the said high constables petty constables and tithing men and every of them to make diligent search and inquisition what tobacco is then sown set planted growing curing cured or made within their several and respective limits and jurisdictions and by whom and to make a true and lawful presentment in writing upon oath at the next general quarter session to be holden for such county of the names of all such persons as have sown set planted cured or made any tobacco and what the full quantity of land is or was sown set or planted therewith and who are the immediate tenant or tenants or present occupiers of the land so sown set or planted who are or shall be deemed planters thereof to all intents and purposes which said presentment upon oath shall be received and filed by the clerk of the said county in open sessions and after such receipt and filing shall be a sufficient conviction in law to all intents and purposes of all such persons as shall be so presented for the sowing setting planting improving to grow making or curing tobacco either in seed plant leaf or otherwise contrary to the said recited act or either of them unless such person or persons so presented shall according to the usual forms traverse such presentment and it is hereby further enacted that all constables tithing men bailiffs and other public officers shall and do within their respective jurisdictions from time to time as often as occasion shall require within fourteen days after warrant from two or more of the justices of the peace within such county town city or place to them calling to their assistance such person or persons as they and every of them shall find convenient and necessary pluck up burn consume tear to pieces and utterly destroy all tobacco seed plant leaf planted sowed or growing in any field earth or ground the other clauses relative to the cultivation of tobacco in this act are a penalty on the officers of five shillings for every rod perch or pole of ground so set planted or sowed with tobacco that shall be suffered or permitted to grow or be consumed in seed plant or leaf within their jurisdiction by the space of fourteen days after the receipt of such warrant or warrants a penalty for refusing to assist the officers and also for resisting them and after making the same provision as before for the physic gardens and reciting many other articles for regulating the plantation trade the act thus concludes provided always and be it enacted that this act shall continue in force for nine years and from thence to the next session of parliament and no longer by an act made the fifth of george the first these acts are confirmed and rendered perpetual the repeated enforcement of them seems to prove that large quantities of tobacco were raised at that period in these dominions and that even the penalty of ten pounds per rod was not sufficient to deter persons from the cultivation of it as an application that has just been made to parliament for an act to permit the growth of it in ireland the observations made in this treatise will not i flatter myself be thought unworthy the notice of the legislature 
that so advantageous a branch of agriculture may not be confined to one division of great britain but that every part of these united kingdoms may be allowed to share in the emoluments arising from it the advantages which will proceed from the permission are too many to be enumerated in so short a work whether a sufficient quantity can be raised in these kingdoms to supply the demand there was for it before the american trade became interrupted as a revival of the demand will be the certain consequence of a reduction of the price time alone can discover but if enough be only raised for home consumption this will be no inconsiderable saving to the nation when the very great profits arising to the planter from every acre of tobacco come to be known they will be appear chimerical if i inform my readers to what they amount i doubt not but that tobacco will be considered as the most valuable branch of agriculture which can be attended to an emulation heightened by the prospect of gain being once excited in the breasts of the landholders of these kingdoms large tracts of land that now lie unimproved will be cultivated and after some years enough may probably be raised to answer the usual demands for exportation by this means the revenue which has been so greatly diminished by the unhappy divisions between great britain and the colonies will be in a great measure restored the duties to be collected for this purpose may either be laid on the plants before they are gathered or during the time of cure as on the article of malt the collection of which would be attended with very little additional expense and probably at no distant period amount to as much as was heretofore received on imported tobacco when the happy era arrives that will unite once more great britain to the american colonies an event i fear more to be wished than expected and a constant uninterrupted supply of this necessary exotic provided the wanted restraint might be renewed as far as is consistent with the situation of both countries at that time by pursuing the rules laid down in the preceding chapters which i have endeavored to give in as explicit terms as possible country gentlemen and landholders in general will be enabled to raise much better tobacco than that which is usually imported from maryland or virginia for notwithstanding there are not wanting prohibitory laws in those countries to prevent the planters from sending to market any but the principal leaves yet as most other commodities are subject to abuse or adulteration they frequently to increase their profit suffer the sprouts to grow and mix the smaller leaves of these with the others which renders them much inferior in goodness the crops that i have reason to believe may be raised in england will greatly exceed in flavor and efficacy any that is imported from the southern colonies for though northern climates require far more care and exactness to cultivate and bring tobacco to a proper state of maturity than warmer latitudes yet this tardiness of growth tends to impregnate the plants with a greater quantity of salts and consequently of that aromatic flavor for which it is prized than is to be found in the produce of hotter climes where it is brought to a state of perfection from the seed in half the time required in colder regions a pound of tobacco raised in new england or nova scotia is supposed to contain as much real strength as two pounds of virginia and i doubt not but that near double the quantity of salts might be extracted from it by a chemical process good tobacco the produce of the northern colonies is powerful aromatic and has a most pleasing flavor the fumes of it are invigorating to the head and leave not that nausea on the stomach that the common sort does as much time would be required to smoke one pipe of it as three of that which is generally used before so great a quantity of the vapor could be drawn from it as to prove hurtful the smoker from intoxication 
would be unable to continue his amusement. I can truly say, after a residence of several years in England, that I never met with any tobacco, though I frequently smoke, that in strength or the delicacy of its flavor is to be compared with that which I have been accustomed to in New England. Many authors have given accounts of the bad effects proceeding from an immoderate use of tobacco. Borhai mentions a person who, through excess of smoking, had dried his brain to so great a degree that after his death there was nothing found in his skull but a small black lump confirming of mere membranes. From the use of good tobacco this could not have happened, for as I have just observed, the fumes which only prove noxious from an immoderate continuance could not have been repeated so often as to produce such dreadful effects. To the instructions already given I shall add that I would advise the planter, in his first trials, not to be too avaricious, but to top his plants before they have gained their utmost height, leaving only about the middle quantity of leaves directly before to give it a tolerable degree of strength. For though this, if excessive, might be abated during the cure by an increase of sweating, or be remedied the next season by more leaves being suffered to grow, it can never be added, and without a certain degree, the tobacco will always be tasteless and of little value. On the contrary, though it be ever so much weakened by sweating and thereby rendered mild, yet it will never lose that aromatic flavor which accompanied that strength and which greatly adds to its value. In the directions before given for raising the plants from the seed, I have omitted to mention the size of the beds in which a specified number of them may be produced. I apprehend that a square yard of land for which a very small quantity of seed is sufficient, they being so diminutive, will produce about five hundred plants, and allow proper space for their nurture till they are fit to transplant. I shall also just add, though the example can only be followed in particular parts of these kingdoms, that the Americans usually choose for the place where they intend to make the seedling bed part of a copse, or a spot of ground covered with wood, of which they burn down such a portion as they think necessary. Having done this, they rake up the subjacent mold, and mixing it with the ashes thus produced, sow therein the seed, without adding any other manure or taking any other steps. Where this method cannot be pursued, though it is much the best, as it destroys, at the same time, the weeds, wood ashes, which are most proper manure for this purpose, may be strewed over the mold in which the seed is designed to be sown. The author presumes that the preceding instructions will be found sufficient for any person inclined to enter upon the cultivation of tobacco. Yet, if any nobleman or gentleman wishes to consult him upon the subject, he will give his attendance on receiving a line at his publishers. Fini. End of A Treatise on the Culture of the Tobacco Plant by Jonathan Carver, Esquire. This recording has been by Roger Moline. A Way of Life by William Osler This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor A Way of Life by William Osler An Address to Yale Students Sunday evening, April 20th, 1913 what each day needs that shalt thou ask, each day will set its proper task. Goethe Fellow students, every man has a philosophy of life in thought, in word, or in deed, worked out in himself, 
unconsciously. In possession of the very best, he may not know of its existence. With the very worst, he may pride himself as a paragon. As it grows, with the growth, it cannot be taught to the young in formal lectures. What have bright eyes, red blood, quick breath, and taut muscles to do with philosophy? Did not the great Staggerite say that young men were unfit students of it? They will hear as though they heard not, and to no profit. Why, then, should I trouble you? Because I have a message that may be helpful. It is not philosophical, nor is it strictly moral or religious, one or other of which I was told my address should be, and yet, in a way, it is all three. It is the oldest and the freshest, the simplest and the most useful. So simple indeed is it that some of you may turn away disappointed, as was Naman the Syrian when told to go wash in Jordan and be clean. You know those composite tools to be bought for fifty cents, with one handle to fit a score or more of instruments. The workmanship is usually bad, so bad, as a rule, that you will not find an example in any good carpenter's shop. But the boy has one. The chauffeur slips one into his box, and the sailor into his kit, and there is one in the odds and ends drawer of the pantry of every well-regulated family. It is simply a handy thing about the house, to help over the many little difficulties of the day, of this sort of philosophy I wish to make you a present, a handle to fit your life tools. Whether the workmanship is Sheffield or shoddy, this helve will fit anything from a hatchet to a corkscrew. My message is but a word, a way, an easy expression of the experience of a plain man whose life has never been worried by any philosophy higher than that of the shepherd in as you like it i wish to point out a path in which the wayfaring man though a fool cannot err not a system to be worked out painfully only to be discarded not a formal scheme simply a habit as easy or as hard to adopt as any other habit good or bad a few years ago a Christmas card went the rounds, with the legend, Life is just one damned thing after another. Which in more refined language is the same as saying, Life is a habit, a succession of actions that becomes more or less automatic. This great truth, which lies at the basis of all actions, muscular or psychic, is the keystone of the teaching of Aristotle to whom the formation of habits was the basis of moral excellence. In a word, habits of any kind are the result of actions of the same kind. And so, what we have to do is to give a certain character to these particular actions. Ethics Lift a seven-months-old baby to his feet. See him tumble on his nose. Do the same at twelve months. He walks. At two years, he runs. The muscles and the nervous system have acquired the habit. One trial after another, one failure after another, has given him power. Put your finger in a baby's mouth, and he sucks away in blissful anticipation of a response to a mammalian habit millions of years old. And we can deliberately train parts of our body to perform complicated actions with unerring accuracy. Watch that musician playing a difficult piece. Batteries, commutators, multipliers, switches, wires, innumerable control, those nimble fingers, the machinery of which may be set in motion as automatically as in a pianola, the player all the time chatting, as if he had nothing to do in controlling the apparatus. Habit again. The gradual acquisition of power by long practice, and at the expense of many mistakes. The same great law reaches through mental and moral states. 
character, which partakes of both, in Plutarch's words, is long-standing habit. Now the way of life that I preach is a habit to be acquired gradually by long and steady repetition. It is the practice of living for the day only, and for the day's work. Life in daytight compartments. Ah, I hear you say, that is an easy matter, simple as Elijah's advice. Not, as I shall urge it, in words which fail to express the depth of my feelings as to its value. I started life in the best of all environments, in a parsonage, one of nine children. A man who has filled chairs in four universities, has written a successful book, and has been asked to lecture at Yale, is supposed popularly to have brains of a special quality. A few of my intimate friends really know the truth about me, as I know it. Mine, in good faith I say it, are of the most mediocre character. But what about those professorships, etc.? Just habit, a way of life, an outcome of the day's work, the vital importance of which I wish to impress upon you with all the force at my command. Dr. Johnson remarked upon the trifling circumstances by which men's lives are influenced not by an ascendant planet, a predominating humour, but by the first book which they read, some early conversation which they have heard, or some accident which excited ardour and enthusiasm. This was my case in two particulars. I was diverted to the Trinity College School, then at Weston, Ontario, by a paragraph in the circular stating that the senior boys would go into the drawing room in the evenings and learn to sing and dance, vocal and pedal accomplishments for which I was never designed. But like Saul, seeking his asses, I found something more valuable, a man of the white of Selborne type, who knew nature and who knew how to get boys interested in it. The other happened in the summer of 1871, when I was attending the Montreal General Hospital, much worried as to the future, partly about the final examination, partly as to what I should do afterwards. I picked up a volume of Carlyle, and on the page I opened, there was the familiar sentence, Our main business is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. A commonplace sentiment enough, but it hit and struck and helped, and was the starting point of a habit that has enabled me to utilize to the full the single talent entrusted to me. The workers in Christ's vineyard were hired by the day, only for this day are we to ask for our daily bread, and we are expressly bidden to take no thought for the morrow. To the modern world these commands have an oriental savour, counsels of perfection akin to certain of the Beatitudes, stimuli to aspiration, not to action. I am prepared, on the contrary, to urge the literal acceptance of the advice not in the mood of Ecclesiastes, go to now. Ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. Not in the Epicurean spirit of Omar with his jug of wine and thou, but in the modernist spirit as a way of life, a habit, a strong enchantment, at once against the mysticism of the East and the pessimism that too easily besets us. Change that hard saying, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, into the goodness thereof. Since the chief worries of life arise from the foolish habit of looking before and after, as a patient with double vision from some transient unequal action of the muscles of the eye finds magical relief from well-adjusted glasses, so returning to the clear binocular vision of today, the over-anxious student 
finds peace when he looks neither backward to the past nor forward to the future. I stood on the bridge of one of the great liners, ploughing the ocean at twenty-five knots. She is alive, said my companion. In every plate a huge monster with brain and nerves, an immense stomach, a wonderful heart and lungs, and a splendid system of locomotion. Just at that moment a signal sounded, and all over the ship the watertight compartments were closed. Our chief factor of safety, said the captain. In spite of the Titanic, I said. Yes, he replied, in spite of the Titanic. Now each one of you is a much more marvellous organisation than the great liner, and bound on a longer voyage. What I urge is that you so learn to control the machinery as to live with daytight compartments as the most certain way to ensure safety on the voyage. Get on the bridge and see that at least the great bulkheads are in working order. Touch a button and hear, at every level of your life, the iron doors shutting out the past, the dead yesterdays. Touch another and shut off with a metal curtain, the future, the unborn tomorrows. Then you are safe, safe for today. Read the old story in the chambered Nautilus, so beautifully sung by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Only change one line to, Day after day beheld the silent toil. Shut off the past. Let the dead past bury its dead. So easy to say, so hard to realize. The truth is, the past haunts us like a shadow. To disregard it is not easy. Those blue eyes of your grandmother, that weak chin of your grandfather, have mental and moral counterparts in your make-up. Generations of ancestors brooding over providence, foreknowledge, will and fate, fixed fate, free will, foreknowledge, absolute, may have bred a New England conscience morbidly sensitive to heal which some of you had rather sing the 51st Psalm than follow Christ into the slums. Shut out the yesterdays which have lighted fools the way to dusty death and have no concern for you personally, that is, consciously. They are there all right, working daily in us, but so are our livers and our stomachs, and the past in its unconscious action on our lives, should bother us as little as they do. The petty annoyances, the real and fancied slights, the trivial mistakes, the disappointments, the sins, the sorrows, even the joys, bury them deep in the oblivion of each night. Ah, it is just then that to so many of us the ghosts of the past Night riding incubi, troubling the fantasy. Come in troops and pry open the eyelids, each one presenting a sin, a sorrow, a regret. Bad enough in the old and seasoned, in the young these demons of past sins may be a terrible affliction, and in bitterness of heart many a one cries with Eugene Aram, O oh God, could I so close my mind and clasp it with a clasp? As a vaccine against all morbid poisons left in the system by the infections of yesterday, I offer a way of life. Undress, as George Herbert says, your soul at night, not by self-examination, but by shedding, as you do your garments, the daily sins, whether of omission or of commission, and you will wake a free man with a new life. To look back, except on rare occasions for stock-taking, is to risk the fate of Lot's wife. Many a man is handicapped in his course by a cursed combination of retro and introspection, the mistakes of yesterday paralyzing the efforts of today, 
the worries of the past hugged to his destruction, and the worm regret allowed to canker the very heart of his life, to die daily after the manner of St. Paul ensures the resurrection of a new man who makes each day the epitome of a life. The load of tomorrow, added to that of yesterday, carried today, makes the strongest falter. Shut off the future as tightly as the past. No dreams, no visions, no delicious fantasies, no castles in the air, with which, as the old song so truly says, hearts are broken, heads are turned. To youth, we are told, belongs the future. But the wretched tomorrow that so plagues some of us has no certainty, except through today. Who can tell what a day may bring forth? Though its uncertainty is a proverb, a man may carry its secret in the hollow of his hand. Make a pilgrimage to Hades with Ulysses. Draw the magic circle. Perform the rites. And then ask Tiresias the question. I have had the answer from his own lips. The future is today. There is no tomorrow. The day of a man's salvation is now. The life of the present, of today, lived earnestly, intently, without a forward-looking thought, is the only insurance for the future. Let the limit of your horizon be a twenty-four-hour circle. On the title page of one of the great books of science, the Discourse de la Méthode of Descartes, 1637, is a vignette showing a man digging in a garden with his face towards the earth, on which rays of light are streaming from the heavens. Beneath is the legend, Fac et Spera. Tis a good attitude and a good motto. Look heavenward if you wish, but never to the horizon. That way danger lies. Truth is not there. Happiness is not there. Certainty is not there. But the falsehoods, the frauds, the quackeries, the igne fatu, which have deceived each generation, all beckon from the horizon and lure the men not content to look for the truth and happiness that tumble out at their feet. Once while at college, climb a mountain top and get a general outlook of the land, and make it the occasion perhaps of that careful examination of yourself, that inquisition which Descartes urges every man to hold once in a lifetime, not oftener. Waste of energy, mental distress, Nervous worries dog the steps of a man who is anxious about the future. Shut close, then, the great fore and aft bulkheads, and prepare to cultivate the habit of a life of daytight compartments. Do not be discouraged. Like every other habit, the acquisition takes time, and the way is one you must find for yourself. I can only give general directions and encouragement in the hope that while the green years are on your heads, you may have the courage to persist. Now for the day itself. What first? Be your own day's man, and sigh not with Job for any mysterious intermediary, but prepare to lay your own firm hand upon the helm. Get into touch with the finite, and grasp in full enjoyment that sense of capacity in a machine working smoothly. Join the whole creation of animate things in a deep, heartfelt joy that you are alive, that you see the sun, that you are in this glorious earth which nature has made so beautiful, and which is yours to conquer and to enjoy. Realize in the words of Browning that there's a world of capability for joy spread round about us, meant for us, inviting us. What are the morning sensations? 
for they control the day. Some of us are congenitally unhappy during the early hours, but the young man who feels on awakening that life is a burden or a bore has been neglecting his machine, driving it too hard, stoking the engines too much, or not cleaning out the ashes and clinkers, or he's been too much with the lady nicotine, or fooling with Bacchus, or, worst of all, with the younger Aphrodite, all messengers of strong prevailment in unhardened youth. To have a sweet outlook on life, you must have a clean body. As I look on the clear-cut, alert, earnest features, and the lithe, active forms of our college men, I sometimes wonder whether or not Socrates and Plato would find the race improved. I am sure they would love to look on such a gathering as this. Make their ideal yours, the fair mind in the fair body. The one cannot be sweet and clean without the other, and you must realize, with Rabbi Ben Ezra, the great truth that flesh and soul are mutually helpful. The morning outlook, which really makes the day, is largely a question of a clean machine, of physical morality in the wide sense of the term. Chest l'estomac, qui fait le herex, as Voltaire says. No dyspeptic can have a sane outlook on life and a man whose bodily functions are impaired has a lowered moral resistance. To keep the body fit is a help in keeping the mind pure, and the sensations of the first few hours of the day are the best test of its normal state. The clean tongue, the clear head, and the bright eye are birthrights of each day. Just as the late Professor Marsh would diagnose an unknown animal from a single bone, so can the day be predicted from the first waking hour. The start is everything, as you well know, and to make a good start, you must feel fit. In the young, sensations of morning slackness come most often from lack of control of the two primal instincts, biological habits the one concerned with the preservation of the individual, the other with the continuance of the species. Yale students should by this time be models of dietetic propriety, but youth does not always wreck the reed of the teacher. And I dare say that here, as elsewhere, careless habits of eating are responsible for much mental disability. My own rule of life has been to cut out unsparingly any article of diet that had the bad taste to disagree with me, or to indicate in any way that it had abused the temporary hospitality of the lodging which I had provided. To drink, nowadays, but few students become addicted, but in every large body of men a few are to be found whose incapacity for the day results from the morning clogging of nocturnally flushed tissues. As moderation is very hard to reach, and as it has been abundantly shown that the best of mental and physical work may be done without alcohol in any form, the safest rule for the young man is that which I am sure most of you follow, abstinence. A bitter enemy to the bright eye and the clear brain of the early morning is tobacco, when smoked to excess, as it is now by a large majority of students. Watch it, test it, and if need be, control it. That befogged, woolly sensation reaching from the forehead to the occiput, that haziness of memory, that cold, fish-like eye, that furred tongue, and the last week's taste in the mouth. Too many of you know them. I know them. They often come from too much tobacco. The other primal instinct is the heavy burden of the flesh which nature puts on all of us to ensure a continuation of the species. To drive Plato's team taxes the energies of the best of us. 
One of the horses is a ragging, untamed devil, who can only be brought into subjection by hard fighting and severe training. This much you all know as men. Once the bit is between his teeth and black steed passion will take the white horse reason with you and the chariot rattling over the rocks to perdition. With a fresh, sweet body, you can start aright without those feelings of inertia that so often, as Goethe says, make the morning's lazy leisure usher in a useless day. Control of the mind as a working machine, the adaptation in it of habit, so that its action becomes almost as automatic as walking, is the end of education, and yet how rarely reached. It can be accomplished with deliberation and repose, never with hurry and worry. Realize how much time there is, how long the day is. Realize that you have sixteen waking hours, three or four of which at least should be devoted to making a silent conquest of your mental machinery. Concentration, by which is grown gradually the power to wrestle successfully with any subject, is the secret of successful study. No mind, however dull, can escape the brightness that comes from steady application. There is an old saying, Youth enjoyeth not for haste. But worse than this, the failure to cultivate the power of peaceful concentration is the greatest single cause of mental breakdown. Plato pities the young man who started at such a pace that he never reached the goal. One of the saddest of life's tragedies is the wreckage of the career of the young collegian by hurry, hustle, bustle, and tension. The human machine driven day and night, as no sensible fellow would use his motor. Listen to the words of a master in Israel, William James. Neither the nature nor the amount of our work is accountable for the frequency and severity of our breakdowns, but their cause lies rather in those absurd feelings of hurry and having no time, in that breathlessness and tension, that anxiety of feature and that solicitude of results, that lack of inner harmony and ease, in short, by which the work with us is apt to be accompanied, and from which a European who would do the same work would, nine out of ten times, be free. Es bildet ein talent sich in der Stil. But it need not be for all day. A few hours out of the sixteen will suffice. Only let them be hours of daily dedication, in routine, in order, and in system, and day by day you will gain in power over the mental mechanism just as the child does over the spinal marrow in walking, over the musician, over the nerve centers. Aristotle somewhere says that the student who wins out in the fight must be slow in his movements, his voice deep and slow speech, and he will not be worried over trifles which make people speak in shrill tones and use rapid movements shut close in hour-tight compartments, with the mind directed intensely upon the subject in hand. You will acquire the capacity to do more and more. You will get into training, and once the mental habit is established, you are safe for life. Concentration is an art of slow acquisition, but little by little, the mind is accustomed to habits of slow eating and careful digestion, by which alone you escape the mental dyspepsy. So graphically described by Lowell in The Fable for Critics, do not worry your brains about that bugbear efficiency, which, sought consciously and with effort, 
is just one of those elusive qualities very apt to be missed. The man's college output is never to be gauged at sight. All the world's coarse thumb and finger may fail to plumb his most effective work, the casting of the mental machinery of self-education, the true preparation for a field larger than the college campus. Four or five hours daily, it is not much to ask, but one day must tell another, one week certify another, one month bear witness to another of the same story, and you will acquire a habit by which the one talent man will earn a high interest, and by which the ten talent man may at least save his capital. Steady work of this sort gives a man a sane outlook on the world. No corrective so valuable to the weariness, the fever and the fret that are so apt to wring the heart of the young. This is the talisman, as George Herbert says, the famous stone that turneth all to gold. And with which to the eternally recurring question, What is life? You answer, I do not think. I act it. The only philosophy that brings you in contact with its real values and enables you to grasp its hidden meaning. Over the slough of despond, past doubting castle and giant despair, with this talisman you may reach the delectable mountains and those shepherds of the mind, knowledge, experience, watchful and sincere. Some of you may think this to be a miserable Epicurean doctrine. No better than that so sweetly sung by Horace. Happy the man, and happy he alone. He who can call today his own. He who secure within can say, Tomorrow do thy worst, for I have lived today. I do not care what you think. I am simply giving you a philosophy of life that I have found helpful in my work, useful in my play. Walt Whitman, whose physician I was for some years, never spoke to me much of his poems, though occasionally he would make a quotation. But I remember late one summer afternoon as we sat in the window of his little house in Camden, there passed a group of workmen whom he greeted in his usual friendly way. And then he said, Ah, the glory of the day's work, whether with hand or brain. I have tried to exalt the present and the real, to teach the average man the glory of his daily work or trade. In this way of life, each one of you may learn to drive the straight furrow, and so come to the true measure of a man. With body and mind in training, what remains? Do you remember that most touching of all incidents in Christ's ministry, when the anxious ruler Nicodemus came by night, worried lest the things that pertain to his everlasting peace were not a part of his busy and successful life? Christ's message to him is his message to the world, never more needed than at present. Ye must be born of the Spirit. You wish to be with the leaders. As Yale men, it is your birthright. Know the great souls that make up the moral radium of the world. You must be born of their spirit, initiated into their fraternity, whether of the spiritually minded followers of the Nazarene or of that larger company elect from every nation, seen by St. John. Begin the day with Christ and his prayer. You need no other. Creedless, with it you have religion. Creed stuffed, it will leaven any theological dough in which you stick. As the soul is dyed by the thoughts, let no day pass without contact with the best literature of the world. Learn to know your Bible, though not perhaps as your fathers did, in forming character and in shaping conduct 
Its touch has still its ancient power. Of the kindred of Ram and sons of Elihu, you should know its beauties and its strength. Fifteen or twenty minutes day by day will give you fellowship with the great minds of the race. And little by little as the years pass, you extend your friendship with the immortal dead. They will give you faith in your own day. Listen while they speak to you of the fathers. But each age has its own spirit and ideas, just as it has its own manners and pleasures. You are right to believe that yours is the best university, at its best period. Why should you look back to be shocked at the frowsiness and dullness of the students of the seventies or even of the nineties? Cast no thought forward, lest you reach a period when you and yours will present to your successors the same dowdiness of clothes and times. But while change is the law, certain great ideas flow fresh through the ages and control us effectually as in the days of Pericles. Mankind, it has been said, is always advancing. Man is always the same. The love, hope, fear, and faith that make humanity, and the elemental passions of the human heart remain unchanged, and the secret of inspiration in any literature is the capacity to touch the chord that vibrates in a sympathy that knows nor time nor place. The quiet life in daytight compartments will help you to bear your own and others' burdens with a light heart. Pay no heed to the Batrachians, who sit croaking idly by the stream. Life is a straight, plain business, and the way is clear, blazed for you by generations of strong men, into whose labours you enter, and whose ideals must be your inspiration. In my mind's eye I can see you twenty years hence, resolute-eyed, broad-headed, smooth-faced men who are in the world to make a success of life, but to whichever of the two great types you belong, whether controlled by emotion or by reason, you will need the leaven of their spirit, the only leaven potent enough to avert that only too common nemesis to which the psalmist refers. He gave them their heart's desire, but sent leanness withal into their souls. I quoted Dr. Johnson's remark about the trivial things that influence. Perhaps this slight word of mine may help some of you, so to number your days that you may apply your hearts unto wisdom. End of A Way of Life by Sir William Oslo Recording by Luke Sartor Berkeley, California